and welcome to Development Control A Committee, Wednesday the 2nd of September, 2 p.m. Uh, I just have a few things to say before we uh, move into the formal agenda for today's meeting. The formal legal standing of the meeting. This meeting is being held under government statutory instruments, local government England, the local authorities, coronavirus, flexibility of local authority meetings, England, Regulations 2020. To take account of these regulations, Bristol City Council has produced a set of virtual meetings procedure rules, and these are available on our website. This means that the decisions made by the committee will have the same standing and validity as if they had been made in a meeting at City Hall. Members of public who have submitted written public forum statements, I can confirm that your statements have been circulated to all members of the committee prior to the meeting and will be taken into account when the decisions for each application are made. Some of you have requested to address the committee concerning your statement and have been provided with details on how to do so. You will be held in the waiting room for this meeting until it is time for you to address the committee and you will then be invited in to do so. Please note that you only have one minute to speak. After you have finished speaking, you'll be removed from the meeting, but will still be able to view it via the public broadcast on YouTube. Members of the public, although you will see a number of different people on your screen during the course of the meeting, only myself and the other councillors will make the decision on each application. Members of the committee, could you please ensure that your sound is muted when you're not speaking? Um, and when you finish speaking, please mute your sound again. Could you please use the virtual hand uh, when you wish to speak, rather than the physical hand? If we have one system, it's uh, much more likely to work well. Um, and I, I will invite you to speak by way of the queuing system. Uh, I've checked that all the councillors have their title in front of them, not just for the benefit of the councillors we know each other, but for the benefit of the members of the public, obviously. Um, if, you need, if you need to leave the meeting or return to the meeting, uh, you will need to inform me uh, using the chat function, um, as I will need to judge whether or not you can remain within the meeting. Uh, for uh, decision-making purposes. Uh, other than that, the chat function should not be used between councillors during a meeting. Moving a vote. Uh, when moving a vote, we, we have the procedure uh, in front of us. Um, Please indicate as above, you wish to speak and wait until I ask you to speak. Please then clearly state what you're moving, particularly for the benefit of the public. The first vote for each application should of course be the officer recommendation. If you're seconding a motion, please again clearly indicate you wish to speak and wait for me to call you. This again is particularly for the benefit of the public. Uh, with voting, I will call each councillor in turn by name, working around the screen as I see you. So it may not seem very logical to you, but believe you me, it's the only system I've found that works. Um, and could you please say when voting for, against or abstain? This will ensure that the vote is accurately recorded by Democratic Services, our clerk, Norman, and also enable members of the public to observe the uh, propriety of the vote. Uh, do we have any questions from councillors? Okay, I'm just checking that I have got the right visibility of everybody. So now we move to uh, the agenda. Apologies for absence. We do, I think, have apologies for absence. Councillor Carey? Yeah, Councillor Carey is substituting for Councillor Wright, who sent his apologies. Welcome, Councillor Carey. Any other apologies for absence? I don't think so, because no, I think... No, I'm here. Yeah. 
thanks, Norman. Declarations of interest. Do we have any declarations of interest? Do I see a virtual hand? Norman, does anyone have a virtual hand up? And could you transfer the host to share it with me, please? You're uh, on mute. Great, thank you very much. Councillor Stevens, you have a, an interest to declare. I have two, actually. Um, first one, the, the first um, uh, one that's coming is, um, I've written a book and one of the many things in it is a criticism of the national process for affordable housing viability. Um, so I've considered the Bath Road application against the specific complaints that I have in the book and they're not relevant to the decision coming up. So therefore I'm comfortable to stay on committee. My second declaration is the second um, one coming, which is 85 White Eddies Road. I was the councillor who called it in, so I'll be stepping down and speaking against it. Thank you, Chair. Okay, um, thanks. So at that point, Clive, you'll leave the meeting and you will come back in when called on the link that is sent to you just to for the benefit of anyone watching. So we're clear that you will stand down. And your first one was, was the first ever book plug in a development control committee, I think. Congratulations. Um, I shall buy a copy probably. Um, so minutes of the previous meeting, which was held on Wednesday, the 5th of August. Does anybody have anything from those uh, minutes they wish to be amended, corrected? If not, could I have a proposal could someone raise their hand and propose approval, please? Virtual hand, please. Councillor Breckles, do you propose approval of those minutes? I do, Chair. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Don't have a seconder. Clive. I'll Council second. Oh, Council sorry, fine. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Councillor Stevens has seconded. Excellent. So I will one day sign the backlog of minutes when I've got a spare couple of hours. Um, and so now we move to appeals. Gary, there's quite a lot of them on that list, I notice. Yes, thank you, Chair. There is a, a lot in there, no, not unusually so, and we're now seeing the appeal decisions coming out of the planning inspectorate, which I think for the first couple of months or so lockdown, there's a bit of a backlog, but they uh, seem now to be catching up. So a steady flow of decisions and also ahead of that in the report of the list of all the decisions of all the appeals lodged with the inspectorate with regards to our decision. So nothing too unusual about that. Um, I wasn't going to draw any particular attention to any of the individual cases. There's nothing of particular interest, but happy to take any questions that council may have. Thank you. Councillors, any questions regarding appeals? No? Okay. Um, enforcement? Gary, anything you want to highlight? Um, no, not really, Chair. Only the fact that there have been two notices served since the last time the committee met. Thank you. Anything councillors want to raise about enforcement? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. In that case, we now move on to our first application, 13 um, forward slash 050023 forward slash F 493 to 499 Bath Road, Brislington, BS 43JU. Just to re emphasize, all public forum statements that have been sent in have been circulated to all councillors to be read. So whether or not you wish to speak at any meeting, your statement does go to all members of the committee in advance of the meeting. 
those who have asked to speak, we have uh, Joyce Ward, I believe. Chair, Joyce Ward is not in the waiting room. Joyce Ward, not. Councillor Carey, you've got your hand up. Does that, do you need... Hi, Chair. To... Uh, yeah, um, I think that's a typographical error. It, it's as though we were told it's one three oblique whatever it is in fact one eight zero that number one three will give you somewhere over in back or beyond it, this this is um the number is in fact one eight zero five zero two three oblique f rather than one three okay thank you we will yeah. investigate sorry the... chair um joyce ward has come into the waiting room Right, we'll investigate your correction and we'll come back to you on that. You may well be right, Tony. There may have been a typo there. Meanwhile, um, Joyce Ward, uh, let me just turn. Are you there, Joyce? Uh, could you allow her in, please? Joyce Ward is in the meeting now. Joyce Ward, can you unmute yourself? And test your microphone. Yes, okay. Okay. I have you, yes, on my screen. Right. Do you have a camera, Joyce, so we can see you? Yes, and I, I think it's possibly turned off. Let's have a look. Is that on now? Yeah. Much, much nicer. We can see you and we can hear you. Oh, that's you, good. You Thank have you. one minute, one minute, Joyce, to give us your uh, your thoughts. Right. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Joyce Ward and I speak to you as chair of the resident and board partnership within Sovereign Housing Association and an affordable housing resident of 11 years. I represent about 120,000 affordable housing residents that live in Sovereign's properties by scrutinising everything Sovereign do in terms of strategy, policy, quality and housing standards. It's my job to give Sovereign a hard time. One of residents' biggest concerns is how to manage money, a key part of which is fuel poverty. The type of heating systems residents have is crucial to having warm homes and avoiding stress and debt. Residents must be able to have choice over their energy suppliers, monthly billings, and a regular understanding of how much they're spending. Many of the heating systems in the council's policy BCS 1-4 simply don't allow that and to ask housing associations to install them and to ignore the reasons Sovereign have given for not doing so without any reference to them in the committee report is totally and absolutely irresponsible. These proposals give affordable housing residents choice and control and puts us first, something that the planning process too often fails to do. For all those people in Bristol not fortunate enough to already have a place to live, please approve these plans. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and Mr. Mark Somerville. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you. Mr. Mark Somerville is our next speaker. Mark Summonville is in the room. Excellent. I'm just looking for you, Mr. Summerville, on my array of pictures here. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Please go ahead, Mark. Thank you, Chair. This application from Sovereign, a partner of the Council, proposes a 100% affordable housing scheme of 146 high quality units with a mix of tenures and sizes and redevelopment of an allocated brownfield vacant site in a highly sustainable location, all at a time when the council's housing waiting list stands at over 14,000. The proposals come from four years engagement with the council, residents and stakeholders, and is actively supported by the council's housing delivery team. The original design concept was sketched by the council's design officers. The local ward councillor then praised Sovereign for positively responding to public comments and other positive changes have been made at every stage of officer feedback. On heat and energy and with gas close to obsolescence, the proposals are a combination of highly efficient materials, air source heat pumps, electric heating, solar panels and exceed 20% carbon reduction. 
A barrister's opinion has confirmed the approach accords with policy and is consistent with other schemes that have been recently approved by the Council. Good planning should be about sustainable outcomes, and this scheme is environmentally sustainable and socially and economically responsible for affordable housing residents. Please think of those on the housing waiting list in considering this uh, application and grant approval. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, okay, and I think we uh, hand over now uh, to David, I think. Did we, David? For the officer report, thank you. Thanks, Chair. I'll just share my screen. Chair, could you confirm you can see the presentation? I, okay. I can see that well, thank you. Okay. Uh, Thanks very much. Um, uh, good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. Um, thank you for um, your, your time this afternoon. I have a um, uh, presentation, uh, officer presentation on the application for 493 to 499 on Bath Road. Just to clarify, Chair, the application reference on the uh, statements is it the type where it should be 18 forward slash 05 forward slash f i'll just clarify that and, and get the site address and the presentation is going through in three parts and um, i'll run through the application what's proposed and the response to consultation to date i have some officers from the the council who will also be supporting some of the issues raised in the, the public statements. We will have uh, Jim Cliff, Planning Obligations Manager, to advise us on the affordable housing and viability process. And we have Amy Harvey, who is uh, in the Sustainable City and Climate Change team, who will be outlining the specific uh, uh, approach to uh, BCS 14 and the heat hierarchy, I would also identify some of the statements. Um, and then I will conclude with uh, what the recommendation is for and the proposed reasons for refusal. If I quickly go into the site, um, we have uh, quite a large brownfield site of it's not the point of directly adjacent to Arnest Court Park and um, it has got frontage on to Bath Road and I will show some pictures of what that is currently like and, and what the proposals look like from Bath Road and um, there is also access to the site from Tramway Road which runs to the rear and that provides access to a care home and some of the uh, retail and other commercial uses that use uh, the uh, units of tramway road and um, there has been uh, responses to the application from local residents i would say that the majority have been from the sort of belmont road and, and sterling road so there would be um, the two streets which directly above the site and um, which i can show some photographs of as well there is a dismantled railway uh, which is to the rear of both the, all the units in Tramway Road, which is a, a wildlife corridor as well. Um, the aerial, as shown on the screen, provides probably the site in its context. We can see the Belmont Road and how it abuts the site. We can see its location on Bath Road. We can see the predominant two, three storey existing terraces, which are along Bath Road. And then we see the existing building, which is um, vacant, uh, derelict, and uh, uh, in, in need of redevelopment. We also have the area to the rear of the site, which is cleared. 
and we have a tramway road which provides the access to the care home and the unit here so there's uh, it, it includes that expanse and some of the photographs just for those who who may be familiar or unfamiliar with this area this is walking up bath road so on the approach um, past the Arnest Court Park, which is on the right, you can see on photograph number one, just the top of the existing uh, building, and further up, you can see the existing building and its height and dimensions and, and its safe direction. And you see the, the crossing, which is adjacent to the site. And um, this is from directly looking onto the, the building, and I think shows the current building which is there and has remained vacant for a number of years. You see a dereliction graffiti and, and an eyesore that um, uh, the redevelopment of this site and, and the removal of this is obviously something which is sought. And Roman Walk which uh, goes through the site, we have some photographs here which show the uh, existing uh, link down through to Bath Road and the factory adjacent and then we have Roman Walk which is more residential in its character and again some public comments have come from residents on Roman Walk. To the rear of the site where we can sort of see, you can see the rear of the, the building of photograph number one and the, the area that's cleared and um, we've got uh, the road which provides access to, to go outdoors and then this is the access to the care home which is both served off the road you can see in front of you um, and in terms of background and as we've heard this this is an allocated site it's the orange site um, shown on the di diagram uh, it is it is allocated for an estimated number of homes of 85 with an advice that noise and pollution issues should be addressed. Another aspect considers the application is also located within an air quality management area. And um, whilst the application is in, in since 2018, I've, there has been a, as referred to, a, an ongoing process in terms of the evolution of the scheme. A pre-application inquiry was submitted in 2017 and the members have noted that in the planning history section of the committee report. Um, the application was submitted in October 2018. We have uh, two sets of revised details, one in April 2019 and one in February 2020. Um, there has been an ongoing discussion with regards to viability and, and Jim is going to cover that key issue. But some of the key dates were noted down there. Um, and as referred to in the uh, public statement, a legal opinion on BCS 14 and a response to the comments from the Sustainable City team were provided in June, which we have reviewed and considered. And um, that has informed the basis of the committee report, which has been put before members. Um, just in terms of what the application is for, um, it is for 146 dwellings. Uh, I note that um, reference is made to changes to the scheme. A number of the changes have been made to the scheme layout, internal configuration, and other aspects. In terms of the numbers since the application has been in, at each instance, it's always been for 146 dwellings. Um, those uh, you, you dwellings are split across uh, five blocks, which I'll, I'll come to. Um, we've effectively got sort of four apartment blocks, which would be blocks A to D. And in block E, we have three terraced dwellings, so three uh, uh, terraced houses. Um, the bulk of the development is provided within the central blocks, which is blocks B and C. And we can see uh, car parking and visitor parking. Total number of car parking spaces is 97. Uh, that complies with the council's policies on parking. And um, it has been an issue raised in most of the public comments on the application. 
um, but uh, it is deemed to be compliant and no issue is raised in this regard by transfer development management. Showing those blocks uh, in terms of the layout and the I go to it on the bath road, block B and block C are sort of on, on the central axis through the middle of the site. Uh, block E is it a three terrace dwellings which follows the building line of those on uh, Belmont Road and block D also takes its cue from uh, uh, Belmont Road. It's between two to four stories in that corner. Um, and then you can see the, the bulk of the building within block C. Um, parking is provided within the site underneath both A and B and block C. Again, this is just showing uh, the layouts and you can sort of see where the parking would be within block C and how it would be accessed in terms of block C and B. And in terms of height, scale and massing, this is one of the site sections which has been provided and subject to much of the discussion. Um, it goes along the southern boundary of the site and uh, shows uh, the sort of prevailing uh, typology in terms of housing in the area. So we can sort of see the, the uh, existing and then the stepped nature, which we have four stories in block A, up to five stories at the top of block A with block B, six and seven sort of in this area here. So you can sort of see that nature of the intensity within the site. Um, one of the features you also notice is the fact that Bath Road, as you can see from the photographs, the topography of it increases as you go up, so it accentuates the, the presence of these buildings in this location. Um, we have got, these are some of the elevations. So this is the Bath Road elevation again, showing the adjacent terrace houses which are existing. Um, you can sort of see with the red dotted outline, and again, these elevations are provided in the report in PDF form, so you can zoom in, which is the existing building form, which is on the site, the existing factory. And then you can sort of see the relation between block C in terms of as the site steps back. And we also have then um, uh, from the elevation from the rear of the site, Terms of tramway road, and again, you can sort of see the um, Roman walk where I show some photographs of the the units which are uh, the, the existing houses which are along uh, Belmont Road, and we can sort of see Block D, which goes from two to four stories, of stepping into the site. Um, again, some site section site sections which show that relationships you can see. Uh, block D, and you can see Block E in terms of the two-storey dwelling. So the section sort of helps show where they are within the site. And again, you can see that relationship with the existing houses on Dunnett Road. And um, this is a proposed aerial view, um, which is taken looking down from uh, Bath Road back in towards the, the middle of the site. And again, you can see. Uh, units which are proposed from the back road which are stepped back from the highway and um, up to eight meters given the air quality concerns with regards to the this being an air quality management area so stepping back in terms of and then the issues there and um, you can see uh, building a and building b the sort of hinged relationship and again i think you'll note from the report references made to the relationship between building A and B and I'll come into this in a bit more detail um, in, in a moment. Uh, and then you can see block C and D stepping down and you can sort of see the top of the, the houses proposed uh, at the back of the site. This is a view from Bath Road, so looking up, so similar to some of the photographs I showed earlier, so showing that sort of stepping up from four to five stories on Bath Road. And again, there you can see the topography and the reason for the road. These are some other visualizations short from users adjacent to the hotel, bottom, uh, or Bath Road meets Sandy Road. And again, further up Bath Road, looking back down. 
and there's a view from uh, the park which is being provided which is obviously from an elevated position looking down onto Bath Road and you can see the, the, the sort of both block A, B and C in the, back, in the, in the background. Um, response to consultation in terms of the application itself, we've had um, uh, for a scheme of this size, it hasn't been a huge number of uh, objections, but we have had over 30 uh, points of objection. As I cited at the beginning, a number of those relate to lack of parking and impacts of traffic and access. Uh, points being raised by the development of the site, given the difference between the proposals and prevailing nature of the existing houses in the uh, building heights in terms of building A and building C being raised um, and you know, design quality. A number of these have been outlined in the report. Since the report has been issued, we've had two further comments. One was neither objecting to nor supporting, and one was in support of the application, uh, which is covered in the amendment sheet. Um, We'll come now to sort of trying to address each of the key issues based on our understanding of the application to date. So I'll quickly cover principal and housing mix. Um, I think it's been established both in supporting statements and the report that this is obviously an allocated site. It will contribute to meeting uh, housing targets and um, it's on previously developed land. It's on a for the site which the buildings are vacant and underused. And it would be primarily, in terms of housing mix, it would be a smaller residence, a sort of one or two bedroom dwellings, which would uh, add to the housing mix, which is primarily family sized dwellings. So, overall, the principle of development, as you'd expect in an allocated site, is, is acceptable, and the housing, as is the housing mix proposed. I'll now pass you over to. Uh, Jim Cliff, who will cover by the again for the housing. Thank you, David. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Chair, can you hear me okay? I can, Jim. Welcome. Smashing. Thank you very much. Um, I don't propose to talk in great detail about the viability side of things. Uh, you'll have read the key issue in, in detail in your report. Um, it's not been a hugely edifying experience. There's been long, um, fairly contentious discussions about the viability of this site and ultimately um, the two consultants which are Savills who are acting for the applicant and BNP Paribas who are advising us were unable to reach agreement on a number of the inputs. Um, Savills have consistently stated that they don't feel the site can provide any affordable housing. Um, now what I mean by that obviously because this is a, an application for 100% affordable housing when I say it can't provide or Savills say it can't provide any that means it can't provide any through a section 106 agreement which would be affordable housing provided without recourse to grant. So the rest of the scheme um, would be affordable housing that delivers, that is delivered using grant from housing association or the council or the government. Um, but we were, the way the planning system works and our planning policies is that policy BCS 17 requires up to 30 or 40 percent affordable housing to be provided without grants, so basically at the applicant's expense. So Savile said it couldn't provide any, um, and BNP Paribas concluded that it could provide 22 percent affordable housing. And there was quite a lot of toing and froing, um, no agreement was reached. Um, but despite that being the case, um, the applicant has tried to, to cut through this, I suppose, and has um, offered to provide 22% affordable housing, which is what BNP Paribas said could be provided. And they've offered to provide that all as social rent affordable housing, which our housing colleagues are happy with. And therefore, on that basis, from a, a purely viability perspective, uh, we're satisfied that the offer to provide 24, 22% affordable housing makes the scheme uh, compliant with policy BCS 17. What I do need to ensure you're aware of though, is that because there have been ongoing discussions, uh, which Amy will talk about in a minute, about heat hierarchy measures that have not been 
concluded or agreed, the viability has been undertaken on the basis that no heat hierarchy measures are put in place. The intention was is that we would then, once the heat hierarchy measures were agreed, add those in afterwards and see what impact that had on the provision of affordable housing. So the 22% that they've offered is on the basis that there are no additional heat hierarchy measures. If further heat hierarchy measures were to be introduced, that 22% would come down quite significantly to potentially somewhere around 6% if we put in the best part of a million pounds worth of heat hierarchy measures into, into the site. Um, as, as Amy will, will talk about, there are discussions about heat hierarchy and whether it's either feasible or viable to do it. But the 22% the headline figure that is agreed is on the basis that there is no additional heat hierarchy uh, costs introduced into the site. Um, and that's me done. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Um, can you hear me, Chair? Yes, I can. Great. Thank you. So I'll cover off key issue C, which is in relation to the sustainable design and energy strategy. Um, I'm a project manager in the Sustainable City team, and this is an important scheme to us and offers, officers were hopeful from the beginning that we could get a proposal that meets both the sustainability requirements and the applicants requirements. Um, we've engaged extensively with the applicant on this issue from the outset, starting at the pre-app stage in March 2017, um, the full extent of which is listed in the committee report, which you will have seen. Despite this, the original energy strategy came in proposing electric resistive heating for all dwellings. And in February 2020, this was revised to propose electric resistive heating for blocks A, B and C, which is 134 dwellings, and air source heat pumps for 12 dwellings in blocks D and E. So the use of air source heat pumps does meet the planning policy in those 12 units and complies with the heat hierarchy, but the proposal to use electric resistive heating in the majority of units doesn't comply with the heat hierarchy in BCS 14. And we consider this to be a significant issue with only 12 units on this large scheme complying with the policy. Um, having reviewed the justification as to why electric heating should be allowable in this case, um, we have not been persuaded that there is sufficient justification to demonstrate um, that a heat hierarchy compliance system is either technically unfeasible or financially unviable on this site to set aside the provisions of BCS 14. Um, and therefore, in the absence of further amendments, the recommendation is to refuse this application. Um, could you move on to the next slide, please, David? Um, so in addition to the energy strategy and the supporting information that the applicant has provided, um, they've also provided a legal opinion, which was mentioned earlier, to advise on the energy strategy, um, its approach to meeting the policy and um, the city council officers interpretation of the policy. Um, sustainability officers has provided a response to this, um, which you will have seen in the committee report. And I'll provide an overview of this now together with any additional relevant information um, that's led to our decision. So the key points include, firstly, the fact that there has been significant engagement with the applicant on this issue and significant efforts made to assist in achieving a policy compliance scheme since the pre-app stage in 2017. Um, this included engaging with Bristol City Council's energy service team who subsequently made an offer to undertake metering and billing of communal heat systems on behalf of the applicant um, with a view to overcome the sovereign's concerns around this issue. Um, Bristol City Council also asked a company which the City Council has used for its own housing schemes to provide an initial assessment of whether a ground source heat pump um, with a shared ground array could be technically feasible and their conclusion found that this, this system could be technically feasible for the site subject to some further design work. Um, and in addition through engagement, um, through the engagement we've also acknowledged 
that meeting the policy increases the cost of development and that this can make it harder for RPs. So as a council, we've responded to this issue by making grant money available to assist RPs in providing a policy compliant scheme, including heat hierarchy measures. Um, and regrettably, the applicant has not taken this offer up. Um, the second point I'd like to make is to clarify the relevance of policy BCS 14 and the heat hierarchy. Um, so as you'll know, policy BCS 14 deals with sustainable energy. Um, it's important because it ensures developments are reducing carbon emissions and avoiding systems that need to be retrofitted in the future with lower carbon alternatives. Um, compliance with the policy supports the City Council in meeting its climate emergency goal of becoming a carbon neutral city by 2030. The policy has three key parts that are relevant to this development. Firstly, minimising energy requirements. Secondly, incorporating renewable energy sources. And thirdly, incorporating low carbon energy sources. It also requires a 20% reduction in emissions beyond residual emissions through the use of renewable energy. It sets out a heat hierarchy and um, requires that developments select heating and hot water systems in accordance with this. The hierarchy includes connection to district heat networks, communal heating systems, both gas and renewable, um, and individual renewable technologies. The measures on the heat hierarchy aim to strike a balance between low carbon and affordable heat. Um, each part of BCS 14 is important in its own right, and it's important to note that the heat hierarchy isn't a standalone requirement, it's a means to achieving the objectives of the policy. Um, officers have been flexible in their approach to applying the heat hierarchy um, by allowing the applicant to select any system on the hierarchy. Um, we haven't been prescriptive in the order that which the applicant um, has to choose. So you know that there is there is plenty of choice of the different systems um, while while the upfront cost of electric resistive heating is considerably lower and once installed resistive electric heating will, will require little maintenance the heat hierarchy and our emerging local plan policy purposefully exclude resistive electric heating such as panel heaters um, which has been proposed on this scheme for, three, for, for the following three re reasons. Firstly, high household energy running costs. Um, householders would be exposed to the high unit cost of electricity and increased energy running costs should their demand increase, putting residents at risk of fuel poverty. Cumulative impact, secondly, cumulative, cumulative impact on the capacity of the local electrical distribution network, which in our view will increase the cost of decarbonising heat and transport in Bristol. And thirdly, carbon emissions. The applicant has suggested that because the, the grid is decarbonising, electric panel heaters should be accepted as a low carbon heat system. However, the projected reduction in carbon intensity of mains electricity between now and 2050 is predicated on a switch to renewable rather than resistive electric heating. Renewable heat through heat pumps typically uses about 2.5 to three times less electricity compared to electric resistive heating to meet the same demand. So it's considerably lower in terms of carbon emissions. Finally, and in conclusion, um, I just want to provide an overview of the summary of how officers have assessed compliance with the, the BCS 14 heat hierarchy. We've looked at two things, both technical feasibility and financial viability. On technical feasibility, we expect applicants to consider the technical requirements of heat systems um, that are on the heat hierarchy and then design schemes which enable their inclusion rather than designing a scheme first and then retrospectively trying to find a compliant heating so solution that works. Despite the applicant being aware of this policy requirement from the earliest stage through the pre-app advice and the considerable amount of technical information provided by the applicant, our view remains that a heat hierarchy compliance system should have been technically feasible for this site, particularly noting 
the support offered from Bristol City Council's energy service and via the grant funding offered to assist in overcoming some of the concerns raised by the applicant. There are multiple schemes across Bristol that have provided compliance systems, some of which are referenced in the committee report. Um, which demonstrates to us that it is possible to provide schemes which meet the hierarchy. Um, secondly, if incorporation of a heat hierarchy compliance system would make the scheme as a whole unviable and unable to go ahead, then it would be acceptable to select an alternative system that's not on the hierarchy. Um, this information hasn't been forthcoming from the applicant, however, the viability assessment completed on behalf of Bristol City Council by BMP Paribas, which Jim referred to earlier, um, suggests that making the scheme as currently designed compliant with BCS 14 is viable, albeit with a reduced number of affordable units. In conclusion, a heat hierarchy compliant heating system should have been technically feasible for this site. And in the absence of further amendments to the strategy, the recommendation is to refuse this application. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Back to you, David, now. Yeah, uh, hi, Chair. I believe there's been uh, some sound issues with me breaking up. No, and again, um, so. A little bit, a little bit. I don't. I didn't consider it sort of fatal, um, but just a little bit. Yeah. Um, so I've been advised, um, if I'm all signed and no picture, just for the remainder, just till we get through the presentation. So. But fine by me, and we will have questions. So if members didn't pick up something you said, then they will have the opportunity to ask you. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'll I'll try and um. um other things and yeah I'll turn to my video on for the questions and answers when I'm not sharing my screen in the presentation and um, yeah so the next one of the other sort of remaining key issues with the application has been the, the designs uh, the design of the proposed scheme and um, city design group have commented uh, on the scheme initially uh, revisions have been made and I think some of the improvements are noted within the report however some of the uh, issues remain and uh, are evidence in their comments but just to talk through some of them so height scale and massing is one and i think i'll probably best cover that with some of the uh, uh, visual material and um, there has been concerns about the livability and amenity for future occupiers and um, so the number of dual aspect units within the scheme the quality of the courtyard is provided between buildings A and B uh, and also the amenity in terms of the, the design and the units that overlook that. Um, the city design group in terms of trying to um, unlock or solve some of these issues the city design group manager met with the applicant uh, last summer uh, an email was sent last September outlining a potential way forward in terms of removing units uh, uh, between buildings A and B, I believe 12 units, um, which would present some opportunities to increase double aspect units and reconfigure things. Um, the suggested change has not, been, has not been implemented. So the changes which have been made have been very much around layout, internal configurations and what can be done, but the total number of units is also mainly about 146. Um, the Bath Road section and, and changes have been made here. Um, so the stepping of it from four to five storeys has occurred during the um, the most recent um, changes. Um, I think that is heading in the right direction. However, it's where Building A and Building B come together. I think these issues uh, present itself. So um, it's. You can sort of see here the existing building outline, which is in red. You can see the relationship of building A with Bath Road. And then you can see what comes behind um, in terms of the massing associated with um, building B. So it is, um, what is an improvement this impact in terms of what happens onto that Bath Road section is still considered to be an issue. Um, 
<clears throat> one of the points from the layout of building A and building B, you have this um, sort of skewed arrangement, um, which um, during the pre-application stage as a concept, I believe was articulated as a principle. However, the detailed testing of that in terms of all the other things it has to do is it's the building B is as close as sort of two to 13 meters, which is uh, these, these units here in quite an uncomfortable relationship. Um, it also, uh, in terms of the quality of this as an amenity space, given the intensive use of the site, so we're talking at about sort of, um, densities of about oh, just over 200 dwellings per hectare. So, so questions the the, um, the quality and the actual amenity this space may provide. Um, and in addition, the sort of daylight and uh, aspect that uh, these units would have. Um, these are the these are the areas where the suggestion of removing some units was was intimated, but it hasn't ultimately taken place. So that sort of is an issue that um, it sort of remains with the, the scheme. In terms of some of the other livability aspects in terms of the urban living SPD and some of the factors where we have an intensive uh, intense more intense use of the site. Um, the 66 of the 146 dwellings with dual aspects, so we've got about 46 of the units, so the majority are sort of single aspect, and some of the diagrams here show the sort of uh, blue units, which would be single aspect. Um, and another point which has been raised is around the internal layout and circulation of blocks B and C, and long corridors serving potentially uh, 10 10 dwellings, whilst well, efforts have been uh, made to try and improve that, the consideration of the city design group is that we still have limited, quite long uh, corridors and limited daylight penetrating them. Um, those are uh, some of the, so those are the sort of design issues and we can come, come, come back to those. Um, the, in terms of amenity of existing neighbouring properties and um, that, that's been considered through the design process and it's not considered to be any amenity impacts on neighbouring properties so block C is a sufficient distance away from those in room and walk blocks D and E have been, been positioned so that they're in line with uh, the gable end of the end of terraces and, and Belmont road so we believe that in terms of the amenity of existing residents that privacy outlook and daylight of those is respected a transport impact and uh, impact and access um quite a lot has was done during the pre app and during the course of the application and um, was not considered to be um any adverse impacts or any significant impacts arising in terms of increased traffic the developments in a sustainable location, high frequency bus routes and close to shops and services, and vehicle access is proposed from Tramway Road and the existing access and bus was removed. Vehicle tracking is demonstrated with all vehicles can be used as a site. There's a travel plan which should be secured by section 106. The number of cycle and parking spaces are considered acceptable and line with our policies there. And recycling and waste um, deemed to be sufficient and a waste management plan would be secured by way of condition. Um, in terms of the former use of the site and, and its environs, the a remediation strategy was provided during the course of the application and the con contaminated land officer satisfied that subject, subject to carrying it out uh, and reporting any unexpected contamination, the application would satisfy requirements in terms of contaminated land. Um, a drainage strategy has been submitted uh, which uh, would secure sustainable drainage systems so um, our colleagues in the flood risk team are content with the revised drainage strategy has been provided 
um, an air quality assessment was provided with the application, given some air quality management area. And in terms of the effects of local traffic, was not considered to be significant. The development would be set back from Bath Road, and this would be sufficient to ensure future residents would be adequately protected. And um, if for the D, uh, units D and E air source heat pumps have been introduced and a condition will be required in terms of any noise associated with those both for future residents and those on the adjacent land from the road. Um, so um, members will have noted from the report and the balancing of the considerations in this case that um, the application is now being um, given that no further progress can be made on issues relating to the heat hierarchical design that is unfortunately a recommendation for refusal on the allocated site. So um, reason one I'll set out in the report relates to the energy solution being pursued and it's not deemed to be compliant with heat hierarchy. The second reason is one off uh, height scale massing the public realm and really the impact on the amenity of the future occupiers of the site and again relevant policies listed there as well as the urban living SPD and a third one which I've underlined which relates to the amendment sheet which would be with regards to BCS 17 um, which is basically in the absence of uh, section 106 agreement to secure the third of the 32 units proposes affordable housing and um, that would be added obviously in the case of an appeal we would work with the applicants to get that agreed uh, in terms of statement of common ground and a section 106 agreement but um, for completeness that's referred to in jim's key issue to report and is reflected in the updated recommendation so and um, I appreciate we've gone through a lot, Chair, so I suppose I'll, I'll pass for any questions, but uh, myself, Jim and Amy are available for any questions that the members may have. Thank you, David. Thank you. Um, right, questions. I will, as I've said, take you in the order I have. Uh, Councillor Steve Smith first, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, and th thank you for that, that detailed presentation. A couple of questions from me. First, I'm, I'm just a bit confused about this affordability issue, because we hear that 100% of these, these flats or houses are affordable. Then we hear that actually only 22% of, of them are because the rest are funded by a grant and that doesn't count. Um, but the 22% is acceptable. And then we hear we should refuse it because it's not providing an acceptable amount of affordable housing. So can you just clarify why the other 78% don't count when they are affordable? Um, and then why this is a recommendation to refuse if the 22% should be acceptable. Um, and my second question about energy, the argument we heard from Sovereign and, and from uh, Joyce Ward in public forum is that electric heating is better for residents because it enables them to go and buy their energy on the open market and get better value. And, and what we've heard from Amy is that that's not the case. I'd just like to understand why um, officers believe that's not the case. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Smith. Yep. I'll pass to Jim to pick up yep. on the first question, and then Amy can come in on the second question for you. Right, no, it's, it's a very, very fair question, Councillor Smith, and it's one of those strange complexities. So, firstly, as it transpires, as what, what, what you're determining today is an application which would be for 100% affordable housing. So, all the dwellings, all 146 dwellings, would be owned and managed by Sovereign Housing Association as affordable dwellings. Now that might be social rent, which is rented, dwellings rented at no more than 50% of open market value. It might be shared ownership, or it might be some other tenure, but they will all be affordable housing. The council's planning policies require that a developer, any developer, provides up to 30% of dwellings on a site as affordable housing provided with no additional grant funding. So basically provided at the developer's expense with no other public funding added in. Um, so the, the only difference, you wouldn't notice visually any difference between the 22% the that's affordable and the 78% that is 
not for the purpose of this application. And they'd all look the same, but 22% of the dwellings would have been provided basically solely at the developer's expense. So they wouldn't have been able to have recourse to grant funding to assist in the, in the delivery of those dwellings. So the 22% is acceptable. The reason that you've seen a reason for refusal, it's purely a technical thing. And it is because at this moment in time, there is not a Section 106 agreement in place that secures those dwellings. What would normally happen if we were recommending approval, we would recommend that the scheme was approved subject to a Section 106 agreement being entered into. The developer would then enter into it and planning consent will be, be granted. But because the recommendation primarily for other reasons is to refuse the application, if we don't put in the affordable housing reason as a reason for refusal, and the developer appeals, the applicant appeals, then the planning inspector won't require that affordable housing is provided. So it's basically just a technical reason. And what I would hope would happen if members were, were minded to refuse the application, I would hope that if the applicant appealed, having already agreed to provide the 22% affordable housing, they would work with us, as David has mentioned, to get a section 106 agreement signed with us that then we would both present to the planning inspector and say, here we go, we've agreed the 22% affordable housing, that reason for refusal has now fallen away. Okay, can I just, just to clarify then, if, if we were to decide that the other two grounds for refusal didn't stand and we wanted to approve, could the affordability bit be dealt with by condition rather than forcing Sovereign to go back to an inspector just to get the 106 agreed? Yeah, that's a really good point. Yes, is the short answer. If members were satisfied, that they felt that the, the issues of design and heat hierarchy were less important than the provision of, of the other benefits of this scheme and wanted to approve it, then you would approve it subject to a section 106 agreement to deliver the 22% affordable housing. We wouldn't need to just refuse it on that basis because the applicants offered that 22%. So that's an, an agreed position at the moment. Thank you. Thanks for that, Jim. And yeah, just one point is that the 32 units that are being proposed are all social rent. I know that was referred to, but just to clarify. So in terms of affordability of heat, I'll just pass over to Amy. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, yes, yeah, so the applicant is concerned about um, uh, choice for the residents in terms of being able to seek their um, their heat from the open market and cho choose different suppliers to kind of control the the price that they're paying. Um, and the main concern around the choice it comes down to the cost. They want to be able to control their costs. Um, I think it's worth noting that not all like, the measures on the heat hierarchy don't um, limit choice. Um, so there are measures such as um, internal air, in air source heat pumps and ground source heat pumps, um, which the applicant has assessed and um, has found in some cases to be feasible, um, wouldn't limit the choice and would likely have lower running costs than electric panel heaters. Um, and the systems that um, are more limiting on the choice of supplier would be the communal systems, whereby it's managed by a third party um, and they undertake the metering and billing and the, the residents are paying that third party for their heat. So they're controlling the heat price. Um, however, this, this issue could be overcome by um, kind of contractual arrangements and ensuring that the heat supplier is registered with the heat trust, which um, ensures a fair price. And so all of the measures on the heat hierarchy could have through careful design and contractual agreements, um, lower running costs than electric heating. Um, uh, I suppose that, yeah, the, uh, importantly, the downside of um, electric panel heaters compared to some measures on the heat hierarchy, such as heat pumps, is that they use almost three times the amount of electricity. So the residents would be exposed to higher unit costs for heat if they're, if they're using panel heaters. 
Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Amy and Jim. And our next person is Councillor Breckles. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got a few questions. I mean, obviously, um, regarding the issue of the heating, um, obviously, there's a case, I mean, electric energy, you know, is increasingly renewable. So in a way that, but I, I'm starting to take on board what's being said about the cost of running panel heating as opposed to um, an air source heat pump. Could we, if we were reminded to la allow this, would we be able to condition or delegate back to officers a condition to address the heating issue um, by, you know, by swapping it out for, you know, swapping out the panel heat for air source heat pumps or, or something similar. The other question, I've got a couple of other questions. Um, on the issue of housing, affordable housing being provided by section 106, well, if that isn't being, if that isn't possible, given it's 100% affordable housing anyway, who's picking up the bill? Who's paying for the grant? Is it, are we having to, as taxpayers, having to pay the grant or is it, say, is it sovereign housing picking up the bill from another pot of money? I just want to make sure that this isn't some kind of Kafka thing, but we are actually dealing with actual direct costs to us if this, if a section 106, adequate section 106 can't be agreed. And the final question is just a little design one, really, is why is there a war between Belmont Road and blocks D and E? Um, because they match the building line and yet there's something great wall between them and the existing housing on Belt Road. At least the plans imply that there is. So I just want to clarify on that point. I think that's Amy, Jim and David in that order, probably. OK. Um, I might also need to defer to David or Gary on whether this can be conditioned. Um, but... Um, I think um, the fundamental thing is that it's including um, a heat hierarchy compliant heating system should have been considered from the outset and the scheme should have been designed to incorporate that. So the fact that that hasn't been the process means that some parts of the design might be making it more challenging to include a heat hierarchy compliant system. Um, that said, the applicant's report does show that um, a ground source heat pump with a shared ground array could be technically feasible, albeit with some of the boreholes located beneath the ba basement areas and car parks. But the supplier has said that um, it might be possible to serve all or at least some of the site not using those areas, so using more of the more open areas. So we know that part of the site could be served through that means. Additionally, the, um, the, te the applicant's technical feasibility assessment suggested that um, external air source heat pumps, um, individual heat pumps, um, could serve um, the top two floors of the apartments um, located on the roof. Um, so we know that uh, an additional proportion of the site could be served by that means. Um, but I think ideally this would all be, um, all have been kind of incorporated into the design and they will have a material impact. So I don't, maybe David, you could comment on whether it can be conditioned or not. I can come in actually. Um, and yeah, I think the compliance with the heat hierarchy is an inherent part of the design. So I would advise that um, if members felt the scheme was acceptable in all of the regards, that you couldn't then um, impose the heat hierarchy solution via either a condition or a section 106 agreement. It's, it's too interlinked, as I think Amy has set out. Um, I mean, for a bit of background, we've had this scheme, and also members will recall the scheme from a few weeks ago, Glencoin Square in Southmead, two largely acceptable schemes. I mean, there is a further design issue 
in here that needs to be resolved, but two largely acceptable schemes that we wanted to bring to you with support that, and both were um, unresolved due to heat hierarchy situation. I'm glad to say, of course, Glencoin Square, we were able to agree a solution with the applicant and that's why that was brought to you with our support. And so it's with a lot of regret really that we haven't been able to get into the same position with this one. So it is a shame, you know, it's, it's an allocated site, you know, it's largely acceptable subject to the design issues that have been set out and uh, improvements have been suggested, but it's the heat hierarchy, um, lack of flexibility really from the applicants on this one that's uh, in particular holding this one back. Um, Jim, I think was, was it your one now? I think an, another explanation of the, <laughs> the section 106 affordable housing probably. Yeah, and I think Councillor Breckles used the term Kafkaesque to do, dis, dis, do uh, discuss the issue of grant, and and I fully understand where he's coming from on this one because it's almost unheard of that we end up having an affordable housing argument on a hundred percent affordable housing scheme. It does seem obscure, doesn't it? Just um, a bit. We we have to look at these schemes as if they're blind, uh, as, as, as if we're blind as to who the applicant is, as far as viability is concerned. But but all grant is public sector money. So whether that's grant that the Housing Association is getting from the Homes and Community Agency, Homes England as they are now, or whether it's grant that it's getting from the council, that is, that is all public sector funding. So any affordable housing provided with grant is provided using, you know, using the public purse. The, the, the units that are provided through Section 106 are the only ones that are provided solely at the developer's expense. Um, so if you think, if you pretend that it's not Sovereign Housing Association, if you pretend it's any other developer who's trying to deliver what we would, a traditional open market scheme, basically the, the units that would be delivered as affordable through the Section 106 agreement, the developer would be just getting the reduced price that a social housing provider would pay for those units. So it would be taking a hit on every unit. Um, so therefore, those units will be coming forward solely at the developer's expense. And the same principle really applies here in that the units that Sovereign would be being asked to provide through the Section 106 agreement would not be eligible for any top-up grant to provide. So Sovereign would be having to provide those units, in effect, out of their own pocket and would not be able to go back to the Council or Homes England for grant for those units. Okay. That's that's clearer now. Thank you. And then, um, there was one more point you had about the wall, Fabian. Yeah, uh, Belmont Road and Buildings D and E. Yeah, just just to confirm on that. I'm sorry that wasn't clear. The wall is existing, and there will be a walking and cycling route through. So there will be an opening and up point. That is a pos regarded as a positive aspect of the proposals in terms of. Good. Connecting the site in, so yeah, just wanted to clarify as for walking and cycling. Okay, thank you, Councillor Carey. You're next, I believe. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, being a local character, I, I know this site particularly well, and just to hark back to that last moment, that last point, the walkways that we're talking about now. I mean, these were the back entrances to the, the original factory. Um, Bristol commercial vehicles back in the uh, 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, so we local councillors, we're, we're in a bit of a hard spot here. We really do want to see this development happen. But we're not just talking about heat hierarchy here. We're talking about the, the overall design. And we read the comments here that the actual design isn't recommended. Um, so much as we really do want to see this site developed after however many decades it is of inactivity and and fly tipping and what have you uh we, we really yeah we're in a half spot back in 19 uh, 2017 when we first came across this we were told that the, the original height or the height of the whole complex was not going to increase and yet now we see that we're, we're still above the original building heights, although it's been reduced by one floor level. So 
I think the architects are sort of swinging it a bit here, personally. That's my thought, you know. Let's see how many we can get in. Yeah, fine, I'm all for that. But 2017, we were told it would not be higher building than we have there already, than that John Pier building, whatever it's called, that, that is there already. Um, I, I'm, I say, apart from the, the parts of the courtyard, which... Um, We'll never see the light of day. We'll never see sunshine. There's a courtyard there, public space, overshadowed by block C and block whatever it was, A. Um, I've lost it again. Uh, it, it, it really does sort of strike you as odd that somebody designed something like that. Um, no, <laughs> sorry, folks. I'm talking to myself here, thinking aloud, really. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to stop there because I'm just getting myself a little bit more confused. As to which got, way I'm going to... I've got a question, Councillor Carey. I don't you... think I blew an ab, actually, Don. I think I'm... Um, okay. I think you just made yourself... a contribution to the debate section, so perhaps you'll... Uh, you'll uh, Sorry, push... Don. Yeah, I rather talked myself out of that question, I think. Yeah, no problem, no problem. Uh, you're a visitor. Uh, Councillor Stevens. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, I have four questions. Um, first, first, first one, um, if we uh, wanted the heat hierarchy and it brought the affordable housing section 106 from 22% down to 6%, would we get grants for the other 94%? So we'd still have 100% affordable housing, but we'd actually have more efficient heat. That's question one. Question two, my understanding from listening to Joyce and Mark's statements was it was more than just being able to switch supplier, but it's being able to switch the energy off so you don't get a bill one month if you really are up against it financially. And so which of the heat hierarchy solutions enables that as well? Uh, question three is to do with air quality. We re uh, DCB refused uh, some affordable housing on, I think, Lower Ashley Road because the uh, air pollution was going to go up. And that's because it, a taller building created a canyon effect. And I'd like to know what the air pollution figures are at the moment and whether any analysis has been done on creating a canyon so the NO2 gets stuck there. And my final question is to do with the apex of that building between A and B, block A and B, and what the properties are like in that apex, because it strikes me if they have any windows, it will be very dark even in midday. So those are my four questions. Four or five, was it? But any four? We'll, we'll take the four. Okay, the first one then was, um, I think, to Amy, was it? No, it was to Jim about 94% um, from grants. Sorry, yes. Yeah. Um, the honest answer is, I don't know. The likelihood, though, Councillor Stevens, is that, yes, they would be. You would expect they would be um, looking to provide those extra units as it were through grant because the applicant is saying they can't provide any you know or was originally saying they can't provide any section 106 affordable housing but they want to provide a 100 percent affordable scheme so therefore that would suggest that they want i in an ideal world they would like to deliver the whole lot through grant that would be my my reading of the situation um, but they have have conceded to provide this 22% with, with no grant. So yes, I would imagine that if we said, you know, if, if the heat hierarchy measures were put in, which reduced the level of affordable through section 106, I would imagine, though I couldn't guarantee that the remainder, the, the balance would be provided through grant, yes. Okay, thank you. Now we go to Amy on the, being able to switch on the heat hierarchy, can you actually switch off, say, um, for a month in order to save bills? Yes. Um, so you could do that with heat pumps, um, the in individual heat pumps, which um, I mentioned previously have been shown to be mm. feasible for some of the scheme. Um, 
the, I think it's the communal systems where it becomes slightly more challenging where you might have a kind of service charge um, kind of being added to the, to the bill. So there might always be, you know, as you would have with a traditional individual gas boiler, you pay a monthly service charge with that. Um, I, th I suppose the, another, another point is that all of the systems on the heat hierarchy, it should be possible for them um, to have lower costs than electric panel heaters if they're designed well. Yeah, I appreciate that, but yeah. the ability to drive the cost to zero if it's really necessary. But anyway, yeah. you've said there are, there are some other solutions enable that, so thank you. That's right. So yeah. my third question was, I think it was air quality, was it? Yes, yeah, and the fourth one was the design. And the fourth one was about this apex and, and not being, having no light. So, yeah. I can deal with the air quality point. So, so just just in terms of air quality, Clive, in this scheme, um, so an air quality assessment has been undertaken. So it, it doesn't um, show that there'd be any significant effects. So in terms of the design and the development set eight meters back from Bath Road, that's the small, that's the four to five story element. In terms of the taller buildings, which would be B and C, they're even further within the site, so they'd be even more further away from Bath Road, which is effectively the air quality management area on the corridor. So no, no concerns have been raised. Uh, OK, uh, and are the NO2 measures above 40? Are, are they illegal or are they lower than 40? The, they are legal. If, if, they, if they, they would have come up with significant impacts if they had a um, the air quality assessment would have shown significant impacts had they gone above those thresholds. I don't have the exact figures in front of me, but in terms of the response from the air quality officer on this, no concerns were, were raised in relation to those levels. I don't understand that. Is it above 40 or below? It's below. It, it, it That's was fine. Thank there. you. It drops off quite quickly. Move away yeah. from. Yeah, eight metres. It yeah. um, OK, and then the final one is... is what it would be like to live on the ground floor in that apex between um, A and B. I'll possibly share my screen, but just to show, other than trying to describe it, if I can show what's attempted to be uh, done in that area. So um, I'll try and, yeah, yeah so oops. So effectively, the the windows have it's like a sawtooth formation, so that they are facing, trying to deal with this very short separation distance by having the windows looking uh, sort of staggered in that formation. So, the the primarily these units in in, in as you say in the apex there. Okay. And that and that's all right, is it? Um, no, that that relationship has been one of the key design issues, which is sort of that that um, one of the suggestions from the city design group has been to try and deal with this relationship. It would involve removing a number of units per floor. It's been estimated about like twelve units to help improve that relationship and potentially increase the number of dual aspect units. But it would involve, I think. Like a lot okay. of the 12 units, so that's that that issue has been flagged, and it's one of the okay. And, uh, and so, a question then if we were minded to approve, is that something that could condition or could would it have to come back to another you know, like a deferral and then come back in, in terms of the scheme as presented? Yeah. Is it something we could say we've, we're happy with everything else, but you have to do something about that little area? Um, as officers, we have advised off that and nothing has happened. I, I might defer to Gary just to see whether he's got a view on that point, Clive, as to what you... I don't know what you could condition, but I'll maybe pass to Gary if he could... Yeah, help. thanks, David. Um, 
it's difficult, isn't it? Because it's a relatively small aspect of a large mm. scheme. Um, nonetheless, as you know, uh, the committee should be determining the scheme in front of it. But as you know, there's a grey area as well as to where uh, seeking a design change is a new scheme or a modification of an existing one. What I look back on is, um, we mean David were reviewing this earlier today, actually, and, and as part of his presentation, I think he said that the, the number of units on the scheme has not changed at all during the various versions. So you've got to weigh up really what the appetite for the applicant is to make those changes. And um, given that, you know, various changes have been made, the number of units has to has has been seen to have to stay the same and that you know some helpful suggestions have been made from city design to improve this aspect and tilt the balance towards support on the on design grounds i i wouldn't be too optimistic about those changes being made but nonetheless that is something that members could do and we would just have to see what the response to that was so when you mean could do we could condition it um, and, and see what the response is you could condition it okay. because it's a, it's a change to the scheme, so the scheme would have to change. So if members were happy in all other respects and wanted to see something change before approving it, then you could kind of give that message out in your uh, resolution. And then we would have to see what the applicant's response was. But it would, it'd have to, it, it's a change that would need to be made before determining the application because it is yeah. it's still a notable change to the scheme. So uh, that one option would be to defer with this particular issue as being something to develop. That, that, okay. that would be the only way to do that. I would okay, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Clark. Thanks, Chair. Um, so my question is about the, the massing and the density um, I think it says in the design statement that it's it's 280, uh, sorry, 208 dwellings per hectare, and that that's considered too high by the design group. Um, I mean, the sort of the poster child of the developments at the moment that's often held up is is Wapping Wharf, and uh, I know Wapping Wharf's more in the middle of town than this, but Wapping Wharf is just under 200, I think. So this is kind of comparable to that. So I'm interesting. I'm interested in are there perhaps I should know this already, but are there particular rules in particular areas about the dwellings per hectare? And if so, where does the the higher densities that are allowed in the centre of town stop? I suppose one of the reasons I'm I'm asking this is it feels to me that the middle of town is moving in that direction if that makes sense. So the, the developments along the Bath Road um, uh, are, have brought the middle of town more in that direction. And therefore I wonder whether we should, we should be more flexible about the densities in this development, which is of course quite close to those. So my basic question is about dwellings per hectare and what the rules are. Um, yeah, I can cover that, Councillor Clark. So um, I think there's no specific rules in terms of people town area should should achieve X. So there's no sort of magic formula. I think within this site, um, I think it's one where officers would support an urban living approach. So um, increased densities but provided suitable amenity and no other factors are impacted. But just to, to go back, just to sort of set context, I think um, so the allocation within the local plans for 85 units, which would be about, say, 100 and maybe about 120 dwellings per hectare. The pre application, which was an inquiry submitted in 2017, that was for about 121 units, which would be about 170 dwellings per hectare. And then the application, which is before, says 146 units. So as you Point out that's sort of 209 dwellings per hectare. So, um, yeah, the, the, I don't think design officers have a, an issue with density if other livability factors could be 
um, resolved. So, for example, if you didn't have the awkward separation distance we've just talked about by the apex, obviously a, a result of getting that quantum of development is those trade-offs. And I think the another aspect would be the level of sort of on-site amenity that comes from that and the compromised nature of that courtyard given the number of future residents. So I think it's it's not there's no objection in density per se. It's just that it's a very high density in which you can support that density provided, you know, livability considerations and other issues don't manifest themselves. And unfortunately I think the trying to get the creation of units on this site does result in some tensions and I think that apex is probably one example where you have a, you know, a lot of future residents living in a quite a compromised environment. Quite a bit of that so this is kind of death by a thousand cuts, isn't it? It's not so much that that particular issue is the issue. It's that there's an accumulation of a lot, a lot, a lot of issues. Would that be right to say? Um, yeah, I think that, um, yeah, the, the, the issue is probably in summary would be the building B, yeah. the, the courtyard associated with that layout, and then some of the amenity impacts that has in those three units we just looked at, which have sawtooth formation, and then associated sort of considerations around single aspects and, and, and sort of the long number of units served the corridor. So those are sort of the knock on effects. Okay. All right. Thank you, Chair. Can we move to discussion now? Is that okay? Uh, right. Uh, Councillor Breckles, you're first. Thank you, Chair. I mean, I'm listening to the questions and the answers. I'm thinking the two issues seems to be the apex. Now, the, the design that was sort of shown to us showed the sort of the French windows on those flats in the, on the, on the apex sort of pointing away from Block A although it looked like they were on the other side, or one of the other bits, the sort of teeth side um, in the officer's diagram. The issue seems to be sort of that space and the um, issue of the heat and the heat hierarchy. And I'm wondering, my thinking is, I don't, pers I don't have a problem with the design. I don't have a problem with the size and the density of the development, I think it is entirely reasonable, but I'm thinking, my personal feeling is I'm thinking we should be looking at maybe a deferral to one, get the offer, get the uh, sovereign to go back and come back with something that does comply with heat hierarchy. And if air and ground source heat pumps could be added, that would be, that would be a solution. Um, but also I'm thinking, could we, given that there's like, Two meters, there's I think 17 meters between building B and building C. Could we push, look at pushing building B during the deferral back a couple of meters? You, you can't you can't redesign the, the scheme, Fabian. Yeah, hang on, hang on, uh chair. We've done it before. We redesigned, we deferred um that scheme in old market last time and the officers and the, the architects came back with a scheme that gave us a whole load of dual aspect flats. It was a site where that was possible. They put in an extra stairwell and we said, thank you very much. We gave it permission. I also remember that being involved on a committee where there was a housing scheme up at the top of Black Boy Hill. It was a retirement apart block and we wanted one of those pushed back. And again, they did it. It we didn't. Re With due respect, we, did, we didn't redesign it. We did, we refused it on the basis of design, and the applicant went away and redesigned it. That was what happens. But anyway, do carry on. But yeah, so we could say, look, you know, um, if they want, if they, if we could either defer and and try and push it, get them to sort of go away and push push uh, block B away from A and towards C a bit to solve some of the problem with the apex and also try and sort something out with the officers about a heat scheme that complies with the heat hierarchy. 
And obviously, if they don't do that, then they are at risk of refusing. But I'm just a little bit loath to refuse it at this point. Just refuse to outright at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Fabian. Councillor Smith, Steve Smith. Thank you, Chair. Just on process first, it, I feel a little bit uncomfortable here because this is clearly a situation where there's been quite a long ongoing and acrimonious dispute between uh, a sovereign and council officers in various departments. And we're in the position of, of trying to, to judge this on the basis of having had well over an hour of presentation and questions and answers, which, which have all been excellent from officers, um, and a one minute statement from sovereign with no opportunity to question them or, or, or hear and understand and challenge what they're saying. Um, I'm not sure what how you, how you fix that, but I think it would be helpful to us to be able to hear more from them and, and to talk to them and question them to understand better their side of, of the argument. But where it leaves me um, is, I think on design, the issues are greater than just shifting one block a bit. There's the, the livability, there's the dual aspect or lack of dual aspect departments, the long corridors. Um, so on the design issues, I, I'm with the officers and I would refuse on that and let Sovereign go and either appeal or that or, or come back with a better design. But on the affordability element, it just seems, I, I understand that what we're doing here is we're applying policy, but for the policy to apply to a not-for-profit grant funded social developer in the same way that it does to a private investor um, just seems seems daft to me. What we're getting here is 100% affordable units. Frankly, I don't really care how they got to be affordable. They are. Um, so although the recommendation is correct in terms of policy, the policy is wrong. Um, and so I, I can't support that. And on energy, I don't feel comfortable rejecting on that, having not heard enough from Sovereign about why they want to do what they want to do. So for me, I think I would reject this, but only on the one ground of design, not on the other two. So I guess that means I have to vote against the officer recommendation. And then if others are with me on that, to then propose a refusal just on that ground. But we'll see what happens. You're right about process there, I think, Councillor Smith. So the next person I have is Councillor Stevens. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm trying to toss up between approve or defer. I, uh, the office is recommending rejection, isn't, isn't he? So I think that has to go first. If that fails, I will propose a deferral, which may be Fabian or second or vice versa, to defer and they have to work on that apex and make things a bit more livable. And if that means they have to move B across, then so be it, that's their choice. So they have to work on those 10 or 12 flats and they need to put something in the heat hierarchy that residents have control over. And if that then knocks section 106 affordable down to 6%, then so be it. So that, that's where I stand, um, a deferral with those two conditions, or signals within the deferral. Signals, that's the new one, is it? Okay, um, Gary is just going to give us a little bit of advice to stop us going too wayward here and uh, on, on process. Gary, over to you, please. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to advise on, on process, because obviously there are a number of options you can pursue. But um, particularly response to Councillor Smith's suggestion about refusing on a limited range of ground. And I heard him say, especially on energy, because you hadn't heard enough from the applicant, just to bear in mind that if the committee were to refuse permission on a more limited range of reasons, then you can't then open that back up again. So that, you know, it, it couldn't really be refused on energy grounds in future if you heard more from the applicant and you weren't happy with how they were dealing with it, for example. So I think, you know, if you're going to make a decision on refusal, it has to be absolutely on, on grounds that you think, you know, we should be um, pursuing, having therefore been satisfied on all the other grounds. So I just wanted to, to uh, make that point, really. If it's a case of deferral, of course, members can do that and send out the signal to 
officers and members uh, and the applicant about how you want to see the scheme change or things to be explored. Again, apologies for repeating. But unfortunately, we've been down this road a lot of times with these applicants, and we we have we've, this is where we've got to. So, just wanted to manage expectations there. But obviously, hearing it from members will, will sound different. So, um, there's that aspect to it as well. Um, obviously, the application's been in a long time. Um, there is the potential risk of non-determination. Um, so, I think it's one that if members were to defer it we would have very quick discussions with the applicants and come back to you quickly really in terms of gauging what progress could be made. Um, and I just want to reassure members as well, we've, we've really sought to engage with the applicants on this. Um, we realised that aside from the design issues, heat hierarchy was, um, that was the main issue. And having resolved this with the other development I referred to uh, last time I spoke, we wanted to do the same here and whether there was even a compromise. Unfortunately, the response back to that after a number of weeks waiting was a council's opinion. And that was quite extraordinary in my opinion and demonstrated really the level of engagement that the applicants were willing to enter into. So I just wanted to say that before you um, made a, a resolution to defer, but. Obviously, if you do, then obviously we will act upon that. Uh, Mike Davis. Okay. Um, I find the design res reasons for refusal a bit puzzling because I've seen much worse schemes recommended for approval in the past. Um, maybe the heat hierarchy isn't ideal. But I do think the developer wouldn't be risking refusal unless they had very good reasons. And I can't imagine they purposely want their tenants to pay more for their energy. They're an experienced housing provider, so I'm sure they have their reasons. This is the biggest 100% affordable housing scheme that has come to committee, at least in the time I've been a councillor. Taking 146 families off the housing waiting list will have huge benefits for the city, such as saving the council a lot of money that it would be spending on emergency accommodation. I think we should only refuse a development like this if we had really good reasons like land stability or a terrible impact on neighboring residents. The development as it is, is fit to be built. It doesn't harm anybody. If it's refused, we'll lose this opportunity, and I think that would be a huge shame. I think deferring is better than refusing, but I think we'd have to be sure that what we'd be asking for is realistic and feasible for the developer to do. So I'd, I'd prefer to approve the scheme. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Goggin. Thank you, Chair. Um, Yes, I'm not too worried about the uh, design um, in terms of the the amount of good it will do for Bristol. I, I think we can we can offset that. However, the the heat hierarchy is a, is a is a you know a red line for me, unfortunately, and because we can't. Um, make it conditional in any way to for the developers to change this hit high heat hierarchy um i'm going to have to go with the officers and um vote to um refuse this application thank you i think that that's i'll just lower all your hands i hope i haven't lowered somebody's hand who still wanted it up uh i think that's the end of all the comments unless anyone quickly wants to come in so I'm looking for somebody to, um, to move the officer's recommendation. Could I have a virtual hand, please? Uh, any virtual hands? Councillor Hickman, I, I assume that is um, the officer recommendation you wish to, or you wanted to make a comment. I'm happy to second that, Chair. Yeah, off Officer's recommendation. Okay, Councillor Hickman, and then I think Councillor Shaw, Councillor Goggin, I'm not sure, had their hand up. 
you don't mind, you won't, nobody will be offended. Councillor Shah then to second. Thank you. That's, that is officer's recommendation as set out in the report, um, including the conditions, including the one in the amendment sheet about the section 106 affordable. Um, that's um, then proposed by Councillor Hickman and is seconded by Councillor Shah. So I'm now going to move around the screen uh, as I see it, and your the only responses are for, against, or abstain. Are we all clear? Good. Uh, Councillor Stevens. So I'm assuming the officers um, still for re rejection. I've just been checking the amendment sheet. So I am going to vote against this motion. Okay, against. Councillor Smith. Against. Councillor Breckles. Against. Councillor Clark. Against. Councillor Goggin. Or. Councillor Davis. Against. Councillor Windows. Against. Councillor Hickman. For. Councillor Carey. For. Councillor Shaw. For. Myself. For. Uh, Norman, where does us leave us? Because I've lost track of counting. Right, so that is five, four, and six against the motion. Five, four, and six against. So the motion is lost. The motion is lost, therefore I'm looking for an alternative motion. Chair, my hand is up. I'd like to propose an alternative. Uh, okay, Fabian. Okay, I would like to propose that we defer so that the issue of compliance with hate hierarchy and the issue of amenity space in the corner between blocks A and B can be addressed and uh, revised. Uh, so, also, I think we'd also have to include the section 106 uh, affordable housing because there is no agreement that that would have to be included in the reasons. Okay, for... if, that has to, if that has to be uh, included as well. Okay, okay but... I think, you know, you know, I think I'm with Clive and others who said that, you know, even if we, you know, if we can deal with the heat hierarchy and make affordable heating, heating has available to these residents when they do move in, then I can, I'm not going to lose any sleep over the fact that the actual amount of grant funded how affordable housing goes up because it's still affordable housing that's taking people off the housing waiting list. So if on the technicality that has to be included, that's absolutely fine. But the issue for me is address that court, that pinch point in the corner and get the heat hierarchy addressed as well. And hopefully um, with a signal from us on top of backing up, you know, the two things that the officers have said need addressing, hopefully that will get Sovereign to actually sort of think again and collaborate with officers to try and find a middle ground. Thank you. Let me, I, may I add I, a to that? Can, How are you? One move, one moment, Steve. Can I move to Gary just to see if that will actually be a um, a reasonable way forward before we look for any confirmation of that? Yes, I can confirm. We could move forward on that basis. Thank you, um, Steve. What did you want to say? Just to say, I, I, I agree with everything Fabian said. I would just like to slightly broaden it if, if Fabian's in agreement to cover the wider design issues that have been brought up. Even if the design doesn't change, I would like to understand Sovereign's response 
to the concerns that have been raised about dual aspect long corridors, uh, etc. And, and also their, their rationale on energy. Even, again, even if they don't change it, I'd like to understand why they disagree with officers and why they want to do what they want to do. Yeah. OK, if, 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 if it's to at least get an explanation from them, that's fine. Yeah. Thanks. Gary, are you OK to codify something like that or is that getting too close to this redesign for you? No, that, that's, un that's understood. OK. John, I've had my hand up a little okay. while. I know, Clive. I know, Clive. You'll have to have it until I ask you to speak. Um, Clive, you may speak. Thank you. I just uh, I agree with Fabian and Steve. I'd just like to add a tiny bit to Fabian about the... Uh, he was talking about the blocks A and B and the courtyard. I'm also interested in the uh, light that goes into any flats or buildings that are in that apex. So I suspect by dealing with the courtyard, you might end up dealing with uh, any particular dwellings in that apex as well. But I think we need to make sure that's, that's clear uh, in that first um, signal. So you're talking about essentially some internal reconfiguration to make those places yeah. uh, either i mean i think there was discussion on taking some of the flats out or if they're going to increase that courtyard they might might change things around a bit but it's only is it i think it's 12 uh 12 dwellings um in there if i remember right so um it's not just the courtyard in that apex between a and b it's actually um, the light getting into those dwellings as well, especially down on the ground floor. Okay. Gary, are we all right with that, roughly, as, as a motion to put to the committee? Yes, that, that's understood. That's fine. Great. Thank you. So I have a proposal from Fabian, and I will assume a second from Clive. Okay. Although Steve did whatever, but let's put Clive down because we need a name in it. Um, are we all clear on on our um, motion to defer and the reasons that we wish to uh, hear more about at our next meeting? Any problems? I'll take your hand down, Fabian, because I assume it's from the last time. Great. OK. In that case, I'm now going to go round the uh, screen as I see it and ask for, against or abstain. Clive. Four. Steve. Four. Fabian. Four. Steve Clark. Against. Paul Goggin. Against. Mike Davis. Four. Four. Chris Windows. Against. Mark. Four. Tony. Four. Afzal. Four. Myself, four. So Norman. Please, what is this, the um, tally? So that is eight for and three against the motion. Okay, so the motion is deferred and we look forward to some positive discussions on the points that we've made and we look forward to hearing at the next meeting very quick, not to be too long delayed, please. Uh, Chair, can I propose a comfort break? Has this been, we've been together two hours now? Uh, yes, if I could just point out, we've been together two hours because you've all chatted a lot. Um, but we yes, you can, you can have a comfort break and you can return here at 10 past four, at which point you've got two more applications to consider. So uh, we will now uh, close for 10 minutes, 10 past four, 
We will begin, please. Thank you.
welcome back everybody um do we have councillor shah has had to leave us for personal reasons um anybody else missing no i think we're all here um councillor stevens you're going to absent yourself because you have an interest in this particular net this next item so we will see you at public forum thank you okay our next application is number 20 forward slash 01032 forward slash f and 201033LA land to rear of 85 White Ladies Road BS82NT. Uh, just to mention again that all public forum statements have been circulated to all members of the committee. And I have three people here who have asked uh, to deliver their statements. To us via Zoom. And so, first of all, I'm going to invite Councillor Clive Stevens to join us. Committee, I object to this application. I'd like to draw your attention to the very last line on the amendment sheet. It says, the officer needs to explain his reasoning why this development does not add to harmful concentrations of HMOs. From my point of view, if it were an HMO above shops, say on White Ladies Road, then I'd see that potentially as okay. There's not a huge amount you can do with that. But here, it's proposed we have a HMO down a narrow lane. It's not a high street. The lane is already 90% plus <coughs> shared accommodation. There's 30% HMOs within about 50 metres and 13% within 100 metres. Other cities have set 10% as the level at which harmful concentrations occur and Bristol is setting that level too. And that is enough evidence that this fails policy DM2. Thank you. Thank you. Just on time. And uh, our next speaker is Caroline Dix, please. Is Caroline in the meeting? Hello. Caroline's Carol entering the meeting now. It's a slow connection. She'll be here in a minute. Hello, Caroline. Caroline, yeah. Can you unmute your microphone, Caroline? Sorry about that. So um, I'd like to object to this application. Granting permission for further HMOs in this location will create a student-only area along Hampton Lane reducing the attractiveness opportunity uh, for residential homes to be developed and occupied on these sites in the future. It will further damage the community in this area with an even more harmful concentration of HMOs and the transient population they bring, which we know affects the physical and mental health of permanent residents, potentially driving them out of the area. The current noise and waste issues being experienced here are already not being effectively dealt with. We all want successful and thriving communities in Bristol, the emerging HMO SPD has been developed to support this. Please give it the consideration and weight it deserves and refuse this application. Thank you. Thank you. And our final public forum statement comes from, is it Merch or Mersh Clark? I'm sorry, I can't be sure how to pronounce that. Mersh Clark is no longer in the waiting room. Right, I'm just hunting around my screen.
She's, she has not attended the meeting. She's not attended. She's not even come. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, then that means we now move on to the officer presentation. Who will be giving us the officer presentation? We have an officer. Uh, David, is that you? Yeah. Hello, hello Chair. Uh, thank good you. All. Um, I will just share my screen um, so that you can view my presentation. Okie dokie. Um, can everybody see that okay? Yes, thank you. Okay, excellent. Um, Could you make this full screen, please? Are we, are we not in full screen? No. Oh. Uh, well, you've got your um, slides. But I promise you, um, if we press on another one... We'll oh, David, I think we've got the, uh, the second screen, so we can see your navigation. And your oh, eyes. So apologies, let me just uh, try and change that then. Uh, right, so it's this one we need to see. Okay, is that better? That's better. Okay. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, so uh, the site that we're looking at this afternoon uh, for this application is um, it's on, the site itself is on White Ladies Road. Um, we're in Clifton Down Ward, um, North Bristol. Um, we're looking at site on the eastern side of uh, White Ladies Road. Um, so that's the Colson side. It's a short distance from the junction with Colson Hill. Um, and in fairly close proximity to Clifton Down Shopping Centre. Um, so this, this is the site itself in an aerial view. Um, the site relates to the, the building and which you can see highlighted. It's a, a three-storey mid-terrace building. Um, it's, a, it's a commercial building. Uh, the building's situated to the front of the site facing White Ladies Road. Um, but the site also includes uh, an undeveloped uh, yard area to the rear, um, which backs onto Hampton Lane. Um, so this, this is the building from White Ladies Road. It contains a restaurant and a bar, a lower and upper ground level. And then you can see that there is a separate access on the left hand side of this image here, uh, which provides access to an office uh, located above the restaurant bar. Um, the, the building itself at the site is grade two listed for historic significance and uh, so are the other buildings within this terrace. Um, the site is within the White Ladies Road Conservation Area and it also forms part of the White Ladies Road Town Centre as well. Um, but the, the application relates to the rear part of this site, um, which you can see in the view here from Hampton Lane. Um, the rear part of the site um, includes a sort of hard surface area, which is used currently for access uh, to the, the commercial unit, the restaurant and bar, the ground floor level. Um, you can see that there's a, a bin store on the back of the building. Um, the, the remainder is used for parking and servicing. Um, the, you can see the, the rear extension there, which uh, relates to the restaurant and bar as well. Um, the, the adjacent sites here are in similar use, both contain restaurants at ground floor level and the rear of both adjacent sites function similarly um, to the site itself. Um, so the application we're considering this afternoon uh, seeks planning permission for a two-storey building uh, to be built on the rear part of the site, which we've just been looking at. Um, the two-storey building would be used as a uh, for student accommodation as a six bedrooms shared house of multiple occupation. The building would measure a total of 15 metres in depth by six metres in width. It would be a maximum height of 7.7 .7 metres high to the, the, the ridge of the roof line, and it would be 5.7 metres high to the eaves. Um, here is an elevation of how the, the building would appear in context on white uh, on Hampton Lane, solid, sorry, um, you can see that on the, the left side of this image, there's some single story workshops and garages um, which are adjacent. And then on the right side of the image, you've got a 
three-story building, which was constructed in approximately 2014, 2015, um, which contains uh, student accommodation. Um, so the, the scale would be somewhere in between um, the buildings adjacent on, on Hampton Lane. Um, the, the building itself is going to be constructed with a uh, fair coloured brick um, with a natural slate roof. Um, a low stone wall is proposed to the front of the site, which you can just see in the image here, um, and that would uh, enclose a, a raised planting area to the street. Um, so turning to a, a ground floor plan, um, you can see that the building at ground level would contain the the access in the northern side of the building. Um, so that would be the, the entrance to the student accommodation at ground level. Um, then you've got four ground floor bedrooms, each of them with a ensuite bathroom. And then um, you can see to the, the rear of the building, so between the proposed building and the existing commercial building at the site, there would be cycle parking and bin storage for the proposed student accommodation. Um, and the access to the existing commercial bin store would be retained on the upper part of uh, that plan there. So uh, turning to the first floor, uh, we've got two additional bedrooms. Uh, in addition to the four at ground level, that gives you six total bedrooms. And then you've got the uh, communal kitchen, living, dining area um, to the, the front part of the building, uh, which would face Hampton Lane. Um, but as you can see from this plan here, um, the windows that would face outwards towards Hampton Lane would be obscure glazed and fixed shut. Um, so during public consultation on this application, um, we've had this application for quite a while. It was submitted in, in March. Um, and since this time, there's been ongoing public consultation um, when the when the application was originally submitted, um, it was submitted as a three-story uh, nine-bedroom uh, HMO, um, but the proposal is now a two-story six-bedroom HMO. Um, so up to the point of this meeting, um, we've received a total of nineteen objections to the proposal. Um, the main the main grounds for objection are um, primarily the sort of main thrust of objection is in relation to the proposed use. Um, so the, the fact that the building is going to be occupied by students as a, a house of multiple occupation. Um, concerns have been raised in relation to the, the noise um, which would result from that use and the impact that would have to surrounding residents. Um, also concerns have been raised in, in relation to the impact uh, to the local community in terms of uh, community cohesion um, there are, there's been concerns voiced in relation to the emerging HMO SPD. Um, we've heard a little bit about that in the public forum statements, um, and I'll talk about that further in the assessment section. Um, but yeah, that, that um, some concerns have been raised in relation to the impact that this proposal may have on the adoption of that um, emerging SPD. Um, concerns have been raised in, in relation to the, the adaptability of the building, um, also uh, waste and recycling storage, um, concerns also raised in relation to um, the quality of accommodation that the building would provide for the, the students that would live there, um, car parking also an issue, uh, concerns raised in relation to um, overspill car parking on surrounding streets, um, and also uh, voice uh, concerns raised in relation to the, the lack of green space within the development. Um, so the, the application has been referred um, by Councillor Stevens, as we've already heard. Um, the key reasons for the referral relate to the, the concentrations of this type of accommodation locally, um, as well as that particularly there's a concern in relation to this 10% uh, threshold, which is set out in the HMO SPD, which I'll, I'll discuss um, further um, shortly. Um, so the, the main issue with this application um, has been the, the policy compliance of um, this particular type of use in this particular location. Um, there, the, the key policy that the council has in relation to this use is policy DM2. Um, policy DM2 states that um, 
HMOs will not be acceptable where there are harmful concentrations and harmful concentrations would exist where there are levels of activity that cause excessive noise and disturbance to residents. Um, harmful concentrations also exist where there's levels of on-street parking that cannot be reasonably accommodated or regulated. Um, harmful concentrations also exist where there would be harmful uh, physical alterations to buildings. Um, also where inadequate storage and recycling is provided and also where a development would reduce the choice of homes in an area by changing the housing mix. Um, so this, this application has been considered against that policy. Um, in relation to the, so I'll just, I'll, I'll run through um, those points and run through our thinking on each of those uh, points. Um, so starting with the impact of the development in terms of uh, its activity and noise um, and uh, how that would be perceived. Um, the, the view of officers is that this site is located um, immediately to the rear of White Ladies Road on Hampton Lane. The site is within the designated White Ladies Road Town Centre. Um, this area is a, is a commercial and semi-industrial context. It's um, a commercial context which includes shops, restaurants, bars, pubs, um, there's adjacent sites that include printers, uh, car repair garages, uh, gyms, martial arts studios, and existing student accommodation. Um, so quite, quite the variety of uses uh, in the adjacent environment. Um, and there, there's also some uh, traditional residential accommodation. This is fairly limited, um, but um, it's generally to the, the opposite side of Hampton Lane, um, which is the Cotton Hill side, and then uh, towards Cossum Hill and beyond. Um, so in this particular location, directly adjacent to the commercial uses, um, it's found that the existing background noise levels would already be higher in this particular area. Um, so the proposed accommodation would be occupied by a maximum of six individuals. And at this location, taking account of the, the context, it's not found that uh, this scale of residential accommodation would be excessive or out of character. There, the, we, we do accept that there would be potential for um, one-off noisy events, um, such as social gatherings. Um, these, these sorts of events can happen um, at any form of accommodation, um, but there is, there's essentially no guarantee that this would definitely occur at this site, um, and therefore refusing planning permission on this basis um, is, is difficult, it's not a particularly robust reason for refusal. Um, there, is, there is essentially more, there's more appropriate routes and systems available to, to managing these unpredictable instances of, of uh, excessive noise and antisocial behaviour. Um, so it, the view of officers is that we're holding uh, planning permission for the use on the basis of occasional high noise events is unlikely to uh, be a robust reason for refusal. Um, the view of officers, the assessment is that uh, the typical residential activity of six occupants, so typical residential activities including sleeping, eating, studying, relaxing uh, of six students would not cause harm to the immunity of the immediate context, um, which as discussed is quite commercial and has high noise levels already. Um, in terms of impact of car parking, uh, this site is within the Cotton Residence Parking Scheme. The parking scheme itself gives us control over the highways. Um, this development would not be eligible for parking permits in the local area. Um, so the existing highway controls, um, including double yellow lines on Hampton Lane and the residence parking scheme on the surrounding streets are sufficient to prevent overspill parking to the, the surrounding area. In terms of uh, alterations to the to buildings, um, no alterations to the existing building at the site are proposed. Um, we've assessed the, the impact of uh, the proposed building in terms of appearance and character, and uh, generally this is found to be acceptable. It's noted that uh, the city design group hold no objection to the proposal. Um, a full assessment of the impact in terms of character appearance is provided within the committee report itself. Uh, in relation to bins and bikes, um, so I talked you through where these would be located on site. Um, there is bin storage proposed 
um, for the student uh, scheme, which would be located uh, out of sight from Hampton Lane. Uh, the bins would be collected by a private uh, waste company and would be taken from the store on day of collection to the vehicle on Hampton Lane, uh, then returned directly to the store. Uh, this is set out within a waste management plan that's, which has been submitted with the application and would be secured uh, by means of condition in the event of planning permission being granted. Um, so uh, in relation to uh, bicycle storage, um, policy requires three, three cycle parking spaces within developments of over four bedrooms and three cycle parking spaces are proposed. Uh, these would be located um, in a similar location to the bin storage, so out of sight from Hampton Lane as well, um, and full details of the cycle parking storage uh, to secure that it would be uh, weather tight will be uh, sought via condition, again, if permission is granted. Um, so turning to the impact of development in, on the uh, availability of homes in a local area, um, the application does not uh, propose any loss of an existing home. Um, so it's not a situation where an existing home is being converted to an HMO. Um, so the starting point is that the, the development would not reduce the choice of existing housing within the area. Um, there is a case that perhaps that this site could be used for a, an additional home for the area and the student uses um, given preference over that, but we've we've considered whether or not this would site would be suitable for residential accommodation, uh, sort of traditional single family dwelling. Um, but we, we we don't actually consider that this site would make um, an appropriate site for a dwelling in this instance. Um, and that's that's mostly due to the, the proximity to adjacent commercial uses, and as well as that, there's a requirement to retain access to the commercial uses for servicing and bin, bin collection, um, which just wouldn't be practical in a traditional residential format. Um, so for that reason, um, it's not considered that the development would reduce the choice of homes in the area um, or change the existing housing mix. Um, so turning to the emerging HMO SPD, um, this was one of the main reasons that the application was referred to, to committee. Um, the HMO SPD currently is uh, undergoing uh, public consultation, um, so it's still still out for consultation. It's not um, formally adopted as yet, um, and uh, we have to bear in mind that it remains subject to change depending on what the, the results would be from the public consultation. Um, but nevertheless, um, we've, we have considered the HMO SPD in our assessment, um, we do we acknowledge the the ten percent uh, threshold, which is stated within the emerging SPD. Um, this site, so within hundred meters um, of the the site, there would be more than ten percent HMOs in this case. Um, so, this um, particular proposal would result in um, thirteen percent HMOs uh, so within hundred meters of the site. Um, so it does it does exceed that ten percent threshold. However, the the SPD um, states that proposals over ten percent are only unlikely to be consistent with local plan policy. Um, it's not a it's not a blanket no on all um, all proposals, and that wasn't the intention of the the document. Um, it's it's to be used as as guidance, and it's not set in stone that the uh, any proposal over 10% would be automatically refused. Um, so this, this proposal has been considered very carefully. Um, we've had a couple of applications on the site and it's been in for quite a while. Um, but um, it's, we're, we're considering these cases on a case by case basis. And um, in, in the assessment in this case, it's it's been considered that the, the policy, which it needs to be assessed against policy DM2, um, the proposal doesn't trigger any of the, the clauses within DM2, which are suggested to represent a, a harmful concentration. So um, despite the fact there's a high level of HMOs in this particular area, um, it's not found that uh, the proposals would represent a harmful concentration. 
And um, that's, that's really it's specifically due to the characteristics of this particular site um, and pre predominantly the commercial environment uh, surrounding this site, which makes it more appropriate in this instance for this particular use. Um, I, would, I would just point out that this um, a decision on this application would not uh, prejudice the adoption of the SPD at all. Um, given that the every case must be assessed on its individual merits, so um, this is not this case would not have any future bearing on any future cases for HMOs in the wider area. Each case would uh, be assessed on its merits as it came forward. Um, so anyway, the the proposal is considered in compliance with policy DM two. Um, for that reason, the application is recommended for approval um, by officers. Um, it's recommended for approval subject to conditions within the report um, relating to construction management. There's some highway improvement works proposed. Um, so uh, we're seeking repairs to the footway on Hampton Lane. Um, we'd also apply conditions relating to renewable energy, uh, sustainable drainage, uh, material details, waste management and cycle parking. Um, but subject to all of these conditions, the proposal is found to accord with uh, planning policy and is uh, presented to members to consider for approval. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, questions, anybody bearing in mind our time is moving on? So, no, no questions. That's the first. Um, do you wish to move straight to discussion then? Councillor Breckles, discussion. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm a bit concerned about the design of this because looking at the, you know, the amount of sealed and obscured windows, you know, I'm just worried about the sort of quality of living for for the people inside it. Uh, and, you know, from a well-being perspective, and I'm just not convinced that this is, you know, this is the way thing to do. I'm also, I also am inclined to lean towards Clive's um, concerns about DM2, which I think, you know, we shouldn't be, I think this could undermine DM2 personally. So I'm not very inclined to support it, shall we say. Thank you. Anybody else? I don't believe so. In that case, I invite um, a motion in support of the officer recommendation to approve. I have two hands going up. Councillor Smith, do you wish to do what I've just said? Uh, yeah, I'll propose the officer recommendation. Okay, are there any seconders there? Uh, Councillor Goggin, Paul Goggin, do you wish to second that proposal? I second that. Okay, so we have a motion for approval in line with the officer recommendation as written down. So I'm going to go around the screen as I see you and the appropriate responses are for, against, or abstain. Uh, Councillor Hickman. For. Councillor Davis. Against. Councillor Goggin. For. Councillor Smith. For. Councillor Windows. Against. Councillor Clark. Against. Councillor Breckles. Against. Councillor Carey. Against. And I am for. Is that everybody? And if so, Norman, where does that leave us, please? So we've got four for the motion and five against. So the motion is lost. Okay, so do we have 
an alternative motion you wish to put before us? Somebody, please. No. You have to have, ah, oh, Councillor Breckles, what's your proposal? Oh, it's down to me, everyone sits on that. Um, they refuse on the grounds of um, DM2, which by the time it goes to appeal should be up and running, shouldn't it? Uh, clarify your thinking, please. I, I... Um, over 10% HMOs. You know, and this will sort of, you know, proving this will push it to 13%, which is contrary to the intentions of DM2. I'm trying to put a lid on it. So, oh, okay. You wish to, the reason then is an over concentration. Yeah. I'm also, I don't know whether it's valid planning, whether it counts on planning, but I'm concerned about sort of the, on the design issue, you know, when you sort of look at the living area and it's all obscured, sealed windows, and you just think, what's that going to be like on a hot summer's day? And what's that going to be like with no views or anything like that? And I'm just a little bit concerned on the sort of design and well-being aspect as well. Now, whether Gary can perhaps advise on that, whether that can be formed into a... a Fabian, form of... Fabian, I think we should stick to the one reason. Uh, which is over-concentration of student accommodation in the area. And you wish to yeah, defer... I mean, I'll second it. So, based on that. Okay. So the motion we have before us, Gary, if you just check this out, is a deferral on the grounds of over concentration of students in the area. Uh, refusal, surely. Um, well, we have to try another deferral, I think, unless Gary is. What do you think? Yeah. Um... I mean, the the decision making protocol would normally lead the committee to move deferral uh, for us to report back on Almost. reasons. Well, anyway, doesn't it? Um, it? But the committee doesn't have to follow that. I mean, if you feel that the issue is fairly clear cut in terms of, I mean, the recommendation is, you know, compliance with DM2, if members are feeling that it doesn't comply with DM2, uh, backed up by the draft SPD. That's a fairly straightforward, you know, flip of, of opinion, isn't it, really? So um, whilst, yeah, we should, it should really stick to the decision-making protocol in terms of uh, the, the relative simplicity of the, of the issue here. And also I'm just thinking about future items in future meetings. It might be worth, you know, moving the refusal, as Councillor Breckles has said, and see see what happens there. Thank you. Okay, so we are going for a deferral. Having said no, that, no refusal, chair, chair. Refusal. Sorry, sorry. Thank you, Fabian. Give us a moment. We are going for a refusal because actually to defer for the fundamental reason of being student accommodation when it's what it is, would kind of uh, lack a certain logic. So we are going for refusal on the grounds of over-concentration of student accommodation in the era, but that we still want to maintain our process in the future. Uh, this is a slight variation from process. So refusal on the grounds of over-concentration in the area. I will go around, uh, we have Fabian, do you wish to move that? Yeah, move that. Uh, anyone wish to second it? I'll second Mike. Mike, second it. Um, I will go around and uh, for, against, or abstain on that. Mark. Against. Mike. For. Paul. Against. Steve. Against. Chris. 
four. Steve. Four. Fabian. Four. Tony. Four. And I am against. Where are we, Norman, on that, please? So it's five, four, then four against. So the motion okay. is carried. The motion is carried and the um, application is refused. Uh, we move now to our third application. Hmm. Which is 20 forward slash 02205 F. And the other one, uh, Harley Place BS8. 8 Harley Place, BS8, 3JT. Just to remind everyone, all public forum statements have been circulated to all members of the committee. And we have one... ...person coming to speak to us, hopefully, and that is Mr Ian... Larkin. Is Mr. Ian Larkin with us? Hello. Hello there. Ah, yes, I see you. Uh, you have one minute to, to give us your uh, statement. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman, and good afternoon, Committee, and thanks for the opportunity to address you directly on this matter. Please continue. You have read petitions from many neighbours and noted 26 objections, including Chiz and our ward councillor. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Perfectly clearly. Please go ahead. Uh, I'm getting feedback from YouTube. I understand. Okay, so why such strength of objection? Yeah, I've turned it off now. Thank you. Um, why such strength to objection? The application is to create a dwelling beside Clifton Village, an area that BCS5 does not target for increased density, and on an unadopted road. And this is at the heart of the objections. Harley Mews was a dirt track until neighbours invested in resurfacing. This is done to a standard that suffices for cars entering, parking and exiting, but not for residential development. And there's already surface damage from activities of eight Harley Place who did not contribute to the resurfacing costs because they have a three car garage. The application would move usage of that garage to the new dwelling, leaving no parking for the five bedroom house. The nearest Bristol waste collection point is over 50 meters from the new dwelling at the corner of Harley Mews and Canning Road, which on collections day, collection days is already full and Harley Mews has just one street light covering the entire length of it. In short, Harley Mews is not suitable for new residences. And hence the council applied a use restriction to another application from 8 Harley Place in March for this same property. If the council overturns that use restriction and approves this application, then on what basis can it decline applications from numbers one to seven Harley Place to convert their Mews properties to residential dwellings? Thank you. Thank you very much. And so we move now to the presentation. Uh, is that you, Liam? Yes, no? it is. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll just share my screen with you. Uh, can everyone see that okay? Yeah, perfectly clear. Okay. Thanks. Um, so this application relates to eight Harley Place. Um, the site is located on Harley Place in the Clifton Ward of Bristol. Um, the host property is a grade two star listed property and benefits from a detached garage slash annex. 
the garage slash annex is the subject of this application and can be accessed from Harley Mews, which is a private road and is home to a number of residential properties, a rear access points and garages for around 13 properties. Um, Harley Mews is home to a variety of buildings and properties ranging from single to three storeys, um, as shown in this um, Google image. Um, the site itself comprises of a three-storey mid-terrace property with a basement and attic. The outbuilding was approved as a garage slash gym in 1998 and as a garage slash annex in 2020. The annex at present has approval for secondary residential accommodation um, and works approved in March 2020 have already been started in, have been started at the site um, as shown in this image here with the two rear windows. Um, in terms of the existing use here, you can see that there is sort of an existing use in there um, and there is a kitchen and a bathroom already in the in the annex, which was um, approved in 1998. In terms of planning history, there have been around, there's been 18 applications on the site. These four are the most relevant, showing the permission for the new garage and gym and then the permission for the garage slash annex um, earlier this year. The proposed development is to convert the existing living accommodation above the garage to be self-contained. In, in March 2020, the first floor internal layout, uh, staircase and rear windows were approved um, by the council. And this application seeks approval for a change of use to the annex, um, solar panels, a ground floor bin and bike storage, and to increase the internal height of the ground floor entrance, lobby and storage area. Um, on the elevations here, you see that the solar panel location and then the, the increased height which is just down here in the in the lobby area in terms of um, neighbor consultation um, they were consulted on the proposed plans on the 9th of june and site and press notices ran from 10th of june to the 8th of july 2020 in total 29 objections were received um, with majority of them relating to the planning application but three for the listed building application um, these are summarised on the screen and they mainly relate to the principle of development, parking, bin and bike storage, um, use restriction on the current annex and precedence for other development in the Mews. Um, we had a an objection from the ward member who um, called the application into committee. Um, these were on the following grounds of size, access, density and use. And the Clifton and Hotwells Improvement Society also objected to the planning application. In terms of consultees, um, the city design team, Historic England, Transport Development Management and Bristol Waste were all consulted on, on the proposed plans um, and no objections were raised um, by these consultees um, and a number of conditions were, um, pro were proposed. Um, so moving on to the, the assessment, um, the key issues of of the development rate to the principle of development, the design, residential amenity, impact on neighbour amenity, transport and parking, waste and sustainability. The application site is within an established use within a residential area and in a, in a very sustainable location, which is in, within walking distance of Clifton, Clifton Village. The majority of changes were previously approved in March and other changes such as the bin and bike store are considered to be acceptable in this location. The pro proposal would comply with the national space standard, standards and is not considered to harmfully impact neighbour amenity at neighbouring neighbor properties as the annex can currently be used as residential accommodation. The host property would retain two parking spaces in the garage and it is considered that the proposal would not harmfully impact parking provision and highway safety within the local area. Waste and recycling would, would be collected with the other properties waste at the collection point and shall be brought back into the property which would be secured by condition. Both Transport Development Management and Bristol Race waste raised no objection to the scheme and the proposal would contribute a 20% reduction in emissions and is considered to be acceptable. Therefore, the application and listed building applications are recommended for approval subject to the following conditions and advices. These relate specifically, specifically to recycling and waste, cycle provision, uh, solar panels, garage use restriction and restriction of parking permits and yeah. Nice. Yeah, thank you thank you liam is that it that is it thank you brilliant thank you very much
Um, so, uh, do we have, I have a hand up already. Councillor Steve Smith, is a question? Yeah, thank you. Um, two, in fact. I, I understand that this oh, development or, or very similar development was approved earlier this year. Um, and physically, this is only a minor tweak. The issue is the use. And it was just when it was approved earlier this year, that was with a restriction on use that this could not be a standalone dwelling, that it could only be ancillary to the, the main house. Um, what were the grounds for putting that restriction there and why do they no longer apply? Uh, second question is over the road, the, a lot of the public forum statements say that the road was, was privately paid for. I'm not quite clear whether it's adopted or not adopted, but um, the public forum says that only p those people who paid for it have the right to park on it. And I'm sure how would that apply then to new residents in a new dwelling if that was allowed? Um, yeah, so um, in relation to the, your first question, so uh, yes, we did approve um, the conversion of the, the first floor from a gym to an annex um, early this year. Um, because that was a householder application for an extension that we didn't actually assess um, whether that could be used as separate accommodation. Um, and I don't know the reasons why um, that has changed from the applicant point of view, but we, we assessed that last application as sort of an extension to the property and for the merits it was on. And then this ap subsequent application is to change that use. Um, and we are, we are now assessing whether it can be used as a separate residential accommodation alongside having sort of transport waste um, and sustainability um, considerations as well. Um, and then in response to your second question, I'm not entirely sure um, what it does mean, whether it's a paid about the people who, the residents who paid for the maintenance of the road um, and what sort of, whether there is anything in any deeds that suggest anything. Um, and it also, it's, um, it is an unadopted road, but probably that's probably considered to be a civil matter rather than a planning matter in this, in this case. Oh, sure, but it does then have an impact on amenity, both for the people living in this potential dwelling and for their neighbours, doesn't it? If if there are problems, if this is granted on the basis that the parking space is available and it turns out it's not, that's going to cause people problems. Um, I, yeah, so parking is obviously retained in the garage and, you know, it, given its sustainable location, um, you know, it could be a car-free development and there is obviously parking within the Muse and in the wider area um, around the site that isn't necessarily in the Muse. Um, but, you know, we're, we're taking the case that parking is acceptable here and wouldn't cause any harmful impact. Um, and that was supported by TDM. So, so, my, so my understanding is that the, um, the existing parking on the ground floor of, the, of this building would still be retained for the occupiers of the main dwelling. And then I think this proposal is almost on the basis of a zero parking approach, which is acceptable in this area. And um, as Liam said in his final slide, we'll put on the standard advice note in terms of um, not to get a residence parking um, permit because it's a, a new property um, applied for on that basis. And um, yeah, it, it's very much it's a. Uh, the, the actual rights over the enhanced lane and the rights to park on it are very much a, a private matter outside of planning, but we feel that it's a, you know, it's acceptable as a zero parking dwelling with that advice note on it. Okay, and is the, that, the lane that the Muse, sorry, I can't remember the, the proper name for it, but is that covered by a resident parking zone? Because if, if it's not, then not giving someone a permit doesn't really make any difference. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so it's not covered. It's got no um, uh, residence parking. It's just a, it's a private road. Okay, thank you. Uh, Clive. Thank you, Chair. Um, so we haven't really made much sense on the parking. Let's try the bins. Um, we've got Bristol Waste saying so long as the resident keeps them inside and off the street when not being serviced, this is satisfactory for Bristol Waste Company. So my understanding is on waste day, 
they'll they'll go down the stairs, get their bins, take them down to the end of this um, private road, and leave them on the uh, council's adopted road. And uh, and then obviously at the end of the day they pick them up and take take them back. So I think that will create a loss of certainly a loss of amenity to residents who live on that um, adopted road. I think if it's a dwelling, i.e. the people live there, then there's a chance they'll work that. But if it's used as a holiday accommodation or that, it's going to create a mess. So can we condition... Uh, I, yeah, I, can we condition that it's actually a dwelling and not a holiday home? Yeah, That's question can, one. Yeah, sorry, can I come in on that one? Chair, um, unfortunately, we can't. I mean, there, there's obviously a lot of debate going on about at the moment how Class C3 dwellings can be used for, you know, Airbnbs and you know, short-term holiday lets. We, uh, through a planning permission, we can't exert any additional controls over that. Um, so, we, we we just, I'm afraid, we just simply couldn't couldn't do that. Okay. But, so that's. A, oh, sorry, Gary. Carry on. Uh, sorry, I was just going to go on to talk about the bin situation, if, uh, if that would help. And just, I think what the committee got to bear in mind, it's, it's, a, um, it's in addition to the, the existing arrangements for those residents on those Muse, on the, on the Muse uh, road. So, then, anyway. so there's already a load of bins um, out on bin collection day already, and this would add another three boxes of blue bag and, and uh, once a fortnight, a wasting. That's my understanding, but Liam, can you confirm? Yeah, I know that that would be the case, yeah. And um, um, you obviously made reference to the, the, the distance from the collection point. Um, so it would be no, there obviously are other properties um, who take their waste down to the collection point. Um, and there's another property, I think it's uh, Fremantle, which is in the um, sort of south, of, uh, north of the property. Okay. It's about the same, same distance um, you, from this one. Do you have a photo or a plan that shows where the collection point is? Yes, yeah, so if I just go, I'll share Thank my you. screen again with you. If I go back. So on this photo here, so this is the site here, yeah. um, and the collection point, I believe, is in this sort of area. Um, and then this property here, Oh, sorry, I'll go back. Uh, this property here um, takes their bins to that area as well. So, so it's just, if this goes ahead, it would be just two properties. Uh, it, you've got one, this property and this property, and then this is a property. Um, okay. And I believe that some of the other residents take their bins down to this area as, as well. Okay. Um, but because it's on a private road, it's, it's right to the edge of the council road, isn't it? Yes. Um, Oh, oh, okay, thank you for pointing that out. I finished. Sorry, no more questions, so let's move on to discussion. Councillor Carey. Uh, right, at the risk of making myself sound even more ridiculous. Um, right, Clifton Park or Harley Place, as that strip of housing is called. Um, yeah, this is rather a, a prestigious building. Um, and I, there are, I've been up and down here a lot. There are never, or I've, I can never remember having seen any bins at the front of these premises. So I would guess that all these bins, if that's going to be our problem, come down to the back of these buildings. And when you look at the Google street plan there, there's actually no pavement at all to put these bins on. They would end up on somebody's garage forecourt or in somebody's parking bay, the way this road, this uh, private road is laid out. So if that's considered to be uh, a problem, then it, it's a significant problem because uh, there, there is no option to put these bins if you, uh, if you look at that particular area. Um, 
you if you can't then restrict also the, the use of this development it, um you know about um, it possibly being an airbnb or, or or something similar as opposed to a private dwelling then i would be of a mind to possibly vote against the recommendation that's all i've got to say on that matter thank you very much okay. councillor breckles yeah, thank you, Chair. Having listened to, read the report, listened to the arguments, um, nothing's convinced me that we should lift the restriction that was imposed earlier on this site. I think the property should remain, this should remain ancillary, you know, attached to the house it's part of. You know, if, it, if they want to use it as a granny annex or something like that, or for friends to stay, that's fine. But I think anything else, any kind of separate dwelling, I think, on this particular spot is... You know, nothing's convinced me that that's OK. So I'm not going to support the officer recommendation. Sorry. Councillor Clark. Yeah, um, I, I agree. Um, it's really Airbnb, isn't it? I think certainly looking that way. Um, there's too many other problems um, involved with, with the parking and the bins. So I'll, I'll be voting against this. Thanks, Councillor Goggin. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'd just like to say that I, I'm in favour of going with the officer's recommendations and approving this. OK, would you like to formally propose that? I'd love to. I'm happy to second that. So I will move round. Officer's recommendation, approve. Uh, I will ask you each as I see you on the screen. So appropriate responses are for, against or abstain. Uh, Councillor Hickman. For. Councillor Goggin. For. Councillor Smith. Against. Councillor Clark. Sorry, Chair. Uh, against. Councillor Breckles. Against. Councillor Carey. Against. Councillor Stevens. Against. Councillor Windows. Against. Councillor Davis. Uh, for. Myself, four. Where does that leave us, Norman, please? Right, that's four, four. And six against. So the motion is lost. Okay, we need an alternative, please, then. To deferment for another reason. Okay, well, I've, I've got my hand up, Chair. I don't know if you can... Smith, you have your hand up, yeah. Is that okay? Um, I, on the same logic as last time, uh, if, if Gary's uh, happy with that, I, I would suggest that the concerns people are raising here, uh, that sim this simply isn't an appropriate location for a, 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 an independent dwelling. So I don't really see much point in deferring it. Um, so if, if it's permissible... I, I, I would propose that we refuse it on the grounds of the effect on amenity to existing residents in terms of parking as well as uh, bins. Okay, so we go for refusal effectively, straight refusal. Do I have that, a that would be my proposal. Uh, Gary, would you like to come in on that? Yeah, I mean, I was going to advise. I think I think because the last item it was it was such a you know a flip of. Uh, an argument and it could quite easily be turned on his head and then so the reason was quite straightforward this was slightly more complex so I was going to offer that we can come back with a, um, a cooling off report in terms of suggested reasons for refusal to see how they looked as once they're drafted but I mean that would be the normal thing we did we would do in our protocol I realised we didn't do that on the, the last item but um, uh, we, we can we can do that but but obviously, committee can choose to proceed as they wish. In, in which case, I'm, I'm quite happy to propose that we do, uh, as, as Gary suggested. Okay, so we have we will defer 
to um, hear reasons why um, we might refuse, appropriate reasons for refusal, which will give us another chance to uh, look at this. Um, so deferral, uh, Steve, just need, just need reasons for deferral, Chair. So just yeah. to provide us, dear, I mean, there was talking about the parking and bins problems by introducing an additional unit of accommodation. Okay, are you happy with parking and bins? Are those the key reasons? I'm not sure that we can. We can't. Can I another one, Chair? Well, yeah, you can, but let's. It's got to be something that is going to um, hold water. But carry on. Yeah, basically, if there's, you know, if there's no reasons to, you know, the reasons why we should overturn the restriction that was placed previously. So, you know, that's clearly an issue. There's a restriction on the property now. So, why should we overturn that now? Well, the application asks for us to overturn it. So, we have to say why we can't. Why we why we shouldn't? It's the wrong way round. You're looking at it. So, what are the reasons why we would like to refuse this? And we will defer to consider those reasons. We have bins. We have parking. We can't have Airbnb because that's not a planning matter. Are those two reasons sufficient? Anybody, Steve? Are you happy to go with that? Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of a better way to express it, but the concern simply is this is not a residential street. It's a back alley that gives access to people's garages. Um, and, and that's not an appropriate place to put uh, a separate dwelling. It's got to be I can't think of a better way of expressing that in planning terms, but that's, I think that's... It, has to, be in, it has to be inappropriate for a reason. Well, I understand that. that. Okay, um, Fabian, do you have a proposal? I have two hands up here. Somebody needs to propose reasons why we're going to defer, if we're going to defer. I think it's someone else's turn to uh, propose, but I'm quite happy with the suggestions that Steve uh, has put up. So that's parking and bins. Yeah, and I, I you know, I... I appreciate you probably don't agree with me, which is fair enough, but um, I think they, those are matters that do have a, a real impact on the immunity of existing residents. I don't think we should if, minimise them. No, 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 I don't disagree. I'm just saying if five people vote to refuse it, I'll be, I'm surprised that so few have got any reasons between you. But anyway, we have two reasons now, which are bins and um, parking. Does anyone want to second those as reasons? I'm prepared to second that if that's a proposal. Okay, so we are deferring to re to with a mind to refuse because of parking and bins. Gary, is that clear enough? Excellent. I am now going to move around the screen as I see it, and I'm going to ask you to respond for, against, or abstain. Mark Hickman. Against. Against. Paul Goggin. Against. Steve Smith. Four. Stephen Clark. Four. Fabian. Four. Tony Carey. Four. Clive Stevens. Four. Chris Windows. Against. Mike Davis. Uh, against myself against Norman does that bring us to the same conclusion as before uh, chair it makes it five four and five against five four and five against um to defer right okay um, well we've already tested we have already tested um, approval 
Does anyone want to go back and test approval again? Is anyone going to vote any differently? Or Chair, you could use your second ca and casting vote. I could, but if I if this falls, then we are just looking for other reasons, aren't we? Okay, I'm happy. I'm happy to um, vote. Uh, against this one, uh, in which case we are now back to square one, looking to defer for what particular reasons. Is there any, um, any legs in the proposal suggestion that um, this extra dwelling in this private road um, possibly um, is, is there some way that, that that would exclude the development of this site because it is a private road and because fundamentally without going on to somebody else's private road which they have paid for how do you access your building I'd say borderline planning matter, really, Gary? Um, I'm certain, definitely not a planning matter, Chair. It's a classic kind of, you know, anyone can make an application, have it considered on its merits on land or without access to that land. you just got to consider it on its planning merits. So I'm um, afraid we certainly couldn't go down that road. It's part of the problem. Mike, your hand is up. Is that indicating you've got... Yeah, um... Can I propose the officer recommendation again? Can we vote on it again and just see uh, what happens? You can do. It's an interesting development, but let's go for it. Um, I'm happy to second that. So, so sorry, we, Chair. Yes. Shouldn't we, the process is um, you go with the officer, then you defer, and then you look to reject. Hmm. Yes. It is indeed. So does, does anyone wish to... Do, well, we have deferred. Does anyone, our normal procedure is to go for reasons for deferral. Does anyone have any further proposals as to reasons why we should defer this other than the one we've tested, which has failed? Sorry, Chair, I thought we'd already dealt with that. I thought we were now on to the fact that one, we've not gone ahead with the officer's recommendation. Two, we have voted not in favour of deferring. So that leaves us with the final option, which is to vote against the officer's recommendation. And surely that's the right way to go now, following the protocol. OK, well, what we, we, we had particular reasons. So given that nobody has any other proposals why we should defer, do you wish to vote to refuse this, outright refuse it? I'd like to test uh, outright refusal because I don't think this is a suitable place for an in independent house. Um, okay, it would be, be nice if you'd given reasons under the last one, but anyway, let's go ahead with it. That, that is my reason because the way it's merged up all with the private garage, you've got two properties all mishmashed up as well as the waste and the um, uh, car parking and I haven't seen any anything that convinces me that anyone's really come up with a solution for that I think it's quite difficult so I, I would suggest and this might fail I'm trying to move things forward but if we propose to reject on the basis of the three reasons one is uh, it's not a suitable location for an independent property uh, and then the other two are waste and um, waste and cars could I just suggest chair that it's, it's more like two two I think, reasons. So. I, think the, I think the mishmashed up isn't a policy I think but, that yeah I, I, I we'd struggle to defend a, a reason that said on its own it's not a suitable place for a new unit because it's an urban area um, 
if it was not a suitable place for a new unit due to inadequate waste collection arrangements and then inadequate car parking, for example, those would be va valid planning grounds. Okay, so we have a refusal for the same two reasons that we were going to defer it. Would that make you happy? Anyone propose? Clive, are you going to propose that? Uh, yes, if you want me to verbally say yes. Uh, yes, I do, because we're removing the mishmashed out bit, because we want, we're not clear what policy we're going to link that with. Um, <laughs> too intuitive for our planning uh, process. So we have the parking and we have the waste and we refuse it on that basis. Do I have a seconder for that? I'll second. Uh, that was Tony, was it? No, it was me. Chris. 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 Okay, Chris Windows to second. Right. Um, so for, against or abstain, Councillor Hickman. Um, against. Yes. Ref refusal um, on the, uh, that basis, those two bases, Councillor Goggin. Against. Councillor Smith, Steve. Four. Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Breckles. Four. Councillor Carey. Four. Councillor Stevens. Four. Councillor Windows. Four. Councillor Davis. Against. And myself against. Where does that leave us, Norman? Okay, so we've got six, four, and four against now. Okay, so we've got 6-4 refusing. So the motion is passed. We refuse it on the basis of uh, waste and um, parking challenges. Do we have that recorded? Yes. Yeah. Okay, that then is the end of the meeting. Thank you, everybody. And special thank you to those who have supported us, our planning officers, our IT and democratic services and anyone else I've forgotten. Thank you very much. And I will, we will see you all at our next meeting. Thank you. Goodbye.